magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent and this is part four of the comprehensive Eldari 9th edition codex review in which I'm going to start talking about the data sheets. I expect to get through about half of them in part four and, and the rest in part five. Before we dive in, uh, one note on this. This is not a replacement for unit focus videos. Once I've gotten through the codex review and I start in on content again, I, I will be doing focus, unit focus videos where we do a deep dive on individual units. All I am attempting to do here is uh, review how the unit has changed, establish what I think its competitive potential is, and then maybe give one suggestion as to how you might use this on the table and maybe identify one or two significant vulnerabilities if there's anything worth mentioning. So we're going to start with uh, characters. I will, by the way, not be talking about special characters as I already talked about those in part one in the craft world section. Okay. The Avatar of Kane. Uh, the Avatar of Kane is rolling in this time at 270 points and he has gotten a huge upgrade. The last time around, I think anybody who was trying to use the, the Avatar of Kame at all in competitive play was doing it by giving him Falcon Swiftness to get his movement characteristic up to nine and using both expert crafters and hunters of ancient relics to try to make up for the fact that uh, his attack profile was a little bit lackluster. Now, the Avatar can no longer take Warlord traits, uh, but his profile, his data sheets have just been buffed beyond even those those bonuses we were giving him before. So he used to be able to get to a nine with Falcon Swiftness for movement. He starts at a 10. He has a weapon skill and a ballistic skill of two. He's strength seven, toughness eight, 14 wounds. Okay, so he no longer benefits from lookout, sir, but my goodness, he's significantly more durable. And on his highest profile, not only does he have seven attacks, but the melee profile for the Wailing Doom now has an option where uh, you double the attacks, you roll double and a lot of um, large melee, melee units have gone this way in the Ninth Ed Codexes. You have some big glaive or something, and so as an anti-infantry option, it doesn't hit as hard, but you double the double the number. So 14 attacks against an infantry unit at his highest profile, 7 against something else. He does now have a declining profile, but the profile is pretty darn good. The ballistic skill degrades, but the weapon skill never gets worse than a 2+. Plus. And the movement skill degrades, but it goes from a 10 to an 8, which is even at 8, it's still better than where it was in 8th edition. The Wailing Doom, huge boost. Uh, you can still shoot with it, but now when you shoot with it at 12 inches assault, 1 strength, 12 minus 4 AP, D6 plus 2 damage, woo! Um, in addition to the single unit that you've targeted being hit, any unit that your line of fire passes through, uh, also potentially takes a hit. You make a wound roll against it. So uh, the Wailing Doom in the shooting phase has an opportunity to do yet more damage, not just because of the improved profile, but also it theoretically can hit multiple targets. The melee profile, the first one, user strength times two, so that's a 14, minus five AP, so it goes through any non- in Vuln armor and then does d6 plus 2 damage that is just that hits monstrously hard uh sweeping blow we've just talked about how it doubles your number of attacks it's strength user which is seven uh still pretty good certainly against any sort of heavy infantry or even monsters probably very solid only minus two ap flat two damage but 14 attacks is a heck of a lot of attacks and 10 at the lowest profile is no joke either he has a four up in Vuln save and get this, uh, you have the number of incoming damage rounding up. So he's pretty durable even against stuff like Bright Lances. Doing D6 plus 3, uh, he's going to shrug off. He takes 5 damage, right? He's, he's going to shrug off 2 of those. He really has some serious survivability. Um, he's good. There's, there's just no doubt. I think, in fact, he's probably one of the best melee monsters in the game. Uh, there's an opportunity to make up for the fact that he, I mean, movement 10, movement 10 is good, but you're, you're still, you're not getting there out of the gate and it still limits him to operating maybe on a single side of the field, even if he makes an advanced roll turn one. But, uh, quicken is one of the psychic powers that can still affect both 
core units and character units. And he does have the character keyword. So even though the vast majority of the psychic powers do not apply to the avatar, Quicken does. So he could make, uh, he could move twice on turn one. And with that very high movement characteristic, he probably can get where he needs to be to really be in the thick of things on turn two. Units within six inches of him can reroll fail charges. So he's got great synergy with uh, maybe Banshees popping out of a transport next to him. I wouldn't just run them up the board with him. I think they'll just be killed. Uh, similarly, Wraith units jumping out of a transport, six Wraith blades in a Wave Serpent or something jumping out of a transport stand a good chance of making a charge with an avatar nearby, especially if you have a Strands of Fate dice to allocate to them. And he also reduces combat attrition tests so you can ignore modifiers to them. Um, that one's not great. That's just incidental. That's not a reason to think about taking him. And he can explode when he dies doing D3 mortal wounds. Uh, I think that, so there's no doubt that he's really, he's really solid. Again, great melee monster. I think he's a really good counter puncher. If you sort of, if you have the 270 points and you need a melee counter puncher that for the most part, at least, especially in the early game, you're, you're going to hold back keep him out of line of sight. And then if some enemy unit really does bear down on you fast, like a demon prince or some tyrannid uh, crusher stampede big monster, you pop him out and he just lays waste to whatever's closed, whatever has closed on you. And in that sense, he probably also has really good synergy with some of the powerful indirect fire weapons. So uh, you can think support platforms and night spinners, which definitely have some play in this codex. Um, and if you're playing a list that is going to have a lot of target saturation, like maybe you have a bunch of Wraith Lords that are going to run up the field, then potentially he can just book it for your opponent, especially if you're playing Eandon. That two-up save that he has, if he can also just sort of shrug off small arms fire so people aren't doing a bunch of damage to him with volume of fire where his ability to have incoming damage doesn't matter, uh, then I think he, he's really, he is very survivable if, you know, somebody's trying to put like 30 small arms shots into him at minus one AP. Well, if he's still saving on a two plus and they're only wounding him on like a six, uh, that actually isn't that scary. I think um, all that said, he has the problem that he can't fly, right? I think I, I any sort of dedicated melee monster unit that takes up a lot of points, you can't put it on a transport, it can't fly. Um, and we've already talked about some reasons why the webway gate maybe isn't the isn't the star option that it appears to be. I think that he's not, he's really good, there's no doubt. But I do think that in competitive play, your, your ability to like jump your opponent with him early is going to be limited. I think it, an opponent probably can kill it. Again, if you're playing in the end list, you've maybe got some options and he will he will pull a lot, of, a lot of fire away from other things. So if you have a very forward list that's relying on target saturation, he has some play. But I think that in most lists, if you want to use the Avatar of Kanan, I think he's not a bad pick. You probably want to hold back with him. He's a melee counter puncher. And then once your opponent has less on the board in the late game, he can pop out and especially with Quicken, just dominate the board in the late game. I think that's a really, really solid way to employ the Avatar. And that's how I plan to use mine. I should also mention the Avatar Resurgent. Wow, this is a lot about one unit. It's going to be a long video. Uh, the Avatar Resurgent stratagem is back. It no longer allows you to resurrect the Avatar if it dies in melee, which is sad. It's instead a fight on death ability. Uh, if your Avatar is destroyed in melee and it has not yet fought this phase. So you don't get to do this if you fight, your opponent kills it. You don't get to fight again. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to fight yet, you can play the Avatar Resurgent for 2 CP and the Avatar fights and gets plus 2 to its attack profile. I will say that there's one thing about that that's slightly un uh, unclear to me, and that is that the avatar has a declining profile, and if it's been destroyed, theoretically it's on zero wounds, and at that point it has no profile. There is no profile for zero wounds. I, I am hoping that this means it fights on its top profile, so seven attacks become nine, becomes nine attacks, but even if it's following, fighting on the one to three wounds profile, despite the fact that it does not have one to three wounds, um, it would still be seven attacks, its starting attack number, because of the plus two. I Hopefully this is FAQ'd, or maybe there's some rare, rare rule that I'm just not thinking of that one of you wants to point out in the comments. Okay, let's talk Farseers. I'm going to talk about the Farseer Skyrunner and the Farseer at the same time, because the only difference is the one is on a jet bike. Uh, the Farseer is still performing the same role in our army, largely that it did the last time, but a few things have changed. For one thing, it can call on Strands of Fate to auto-succeed on, essentially auto-succeed on a psychic power if it needs to, because if you can, 
If you can make one of your psychic dice a six, then the worst you can roll on the other die is a one, and barring somebody denying you, everything is warp charge value seven or better. So that's cool. If our steer still casts two and denies one, uh, it no longer gets a free reroll, but I think the Strands of Fate thing is a balancing mechanic for that. And Ruins of the Farseer now does something else interesting. It lets you modify one of those Strands of Fate dice at the beginning of the battle round. So if you have a Farseer on the board for every Farseer you have that's not an engagement range of an enemy, you reroll a die. Uh, and that's pretty great. Strands of Fate is a super powerful tool, so any ability to manipulate those dice counts for a lot. The Ghost Helm no longer gives you a five up feel no pain against mortal wounds and a three up uh, invuln against perils. Instead, it just makes you immune to perils. This has already, I've only played uh, a handful of games with this new codex, and this has already come up for me. Uh, it's just nice. It's just nice not to have to worry about perils. Still have a four up invuln save, and the Farseer Skyrunner can still ride the wind and move 22 inches. Um, I still like the Farseer on the bike a bit better, just having that for, for both for survivability and being in position to cast. Uh, and then also, frankly, for grabbing objectives late in the game, I think paying a few extra points to get the bike really makes sense. It's 90 points on foot, and it's um, 120 on the, the bike. So it's it's actually not a few extra. 30 is 30 is a lot. Um, but I think that, if, especially if you're only running one farce here, it really probably does make sense to make that investment. Uh, you could, if you're not running an Autark, also put the farce here on the Sunstorm and get both Obsec and 20 inches of movement. And even though the Autark is the more obvious pick for this, I think I said in the Relics video, a farce here with this, especially in the late game, potentially is a really powerful scoring tool. So I think it's definitely something to consider. I've already talked about which psychic powers are the most advantageous. I'm not going to rehash that there, but it, I will mention that I don't think the Singing Spear is worth it. Uh, and this was usually my default position before, um, especially now that shuriken weapons have a longer range, so you're no longer dependent on uh, the Singing Spear for some sort of fire and fade trick. Basically, um, the Farseer Witchblade now has minus one AP before it didn't. It does flat two damage instead of D3 damage. Love it. And it still does the thing where on twos you auto wound. Now you should you you probably don't want your farseer to be in melee, except under the most ex extreme, bizarre, and desperate of circumstances. But if you needed to be, that's not now that it has the minus one AP, that's not a bad profile. He's only got two attacks. The singing spear has no AP. You can shoot with it, but, but it auto wounds on a two, but it has no AP. It does do flat three damage, but it has no AP, and you shoot with it once, and it's just not it's not worth the five points. Uh, if you're running multiple Farseers, it might be worth considering the Foot Farseer as a backline Farseer. If you do, if you are struggling to find the 30 points for the Farseer Skyrunner, remember you can choose a Foot Farseer, put Falchu's wing on him, have a decent move characteristic, uh, and that that's just it's a solid way to pick up some extra points, and it does use up your relic slot, but still a really good play, just as it was before. You can run the Farseer alongside a Warlock Conclave to use Seer Council. I already talked about this stratagem, so I'll just briefly remind you. Seer Council is different now. It doesn't give plus one to all to the, a Warlock and a Farseer for all of their casts. It gives plus one to the Farseer if a multi-model Warlock Conclave is nearby for as long as that Conclave stays alive. And there's a lot of indirect fire in the game, and they don't benefit from Lookout Search. So I think in some matchups, that will be worth doing, and in some, it probably won't be. All right, let's talk about the Autark and the Autark Skyrunner, again, simultaneously. And uh, because we've talked about Warlord trades and Relics, I've already, I feel like I've already said a ton about the Autark, uh, so I'm going to try to minimize it a bit here. But um, we'll talk about the Foot Autark and then, and then the Skyrunner. I, I, I think, by the way, the Skyrunner is, is, is a much more appealing option just, just because points. Uh, the Foot Autark, on the one hand, it's very customizable now. So... He's, he's got a similar profile to what he had before. He's up to, he's got five attacks, which is cool. He's can be very good in melee. Um, the other stats I think are, are the same, uh, but he has a whole new list of options for loadouts. I, there's something that a lot of people, I'm not the first one to point out, however, that essentially there are two different autarchs and this is not what we were led to believe on the Warhammer community page. It's certainly not how they sold it to us. Um, because there are currently two Autar kits. There's the one that came in the Eldritch Omens with the Warp Spider generator that you can choose or not choose to put on. And then there's the old Blister Autar that has the Swooping Hawk wings. We were told that these models were uh, fully interchangeable and therefore customizable. 
And the models are, that part is true, but irritatingly the rules are not. And I feel like maybe a couple of people at Games Workshop just didn't communicate with one another, but this is utterly bizarre. So you can take, you can either build a foot autark that has uh, a warp spinner generator or nothing is just on foot. And there's really not a good reason to do the second one. And then it, it comes with a, a, a shuriken pistol that you can replace with either a death spinner, a dragon fusion gun, or a reaper launcher. And it has a star glaive that you can, if you want, replace with a scorpion chain sword. Uh, or you can give it a howling banshee. You, oh, and you can give it a howling banshee mask if you want to. Excuse me. Um, that's cool. I am going to say that I think I said this in the maybe in the relics video. I'm not a big fan of the missile launcher for the reason that that's a back that that's an autark that wants to be a backline autark and the units that used to benefit from the backline autark because particularly the night spinners no longer do the autark aura now only benefits core units so within six inches so i mean what what do you have that's a core unit that can fight that can shoot from the very back of your deployment zone or from your deployment zone or from far enough away that that reaper launcher makes sense well dark reapers dark reapers took a big nerf I've already talked about why in earlier videos. So I just don't think that the synergy is really there for that one, uh, which leaves the Death Spinner or the Dragon Fusion Gun. The Death Spinner is now better. It's Assault D6, Strength 6, minus 2 AP, Blast, woo! If you have the Eldritch Omens box set though, you noticed that in some earlier playtest version, it auto hit, it doesn't anymore. I think this is solid, but I think it's solid for a squad of Warp Spiders where you have like five of these things generating hits on a salty six. And if it's blast, they can just totally destroy some unit of Tyranid Gaunts or something. And if it's not a unit large enough for that, you still, you're still you rolling enough D6 of shots that it's still a super hard hit, even at one damage. Those new Warp Spiders are really good. But a single Death Spinner on an Autark, I'm pretty unpersuaded by. I think the Dragon Fusion Gun, though, on the other hand, in concert with the uh, Autark Jump Generator, probably does have some teeth. The Dragon Fusion Gun has... Uh, a range of 12 and if the the jump generator is on there you have the opportunity to either use the move characteristic of 12 or uh you can bring the autark in out of deep strike without spending cp so you could you know plop it down in your midfield next to some midfield units that are going to benefit from that reroll, like shining spears or fire dragons or even dire avengers blast something with the dragon fusion gun which is now strength nine minus four ap d6 plus two that's really good and if your Autark is kitted out to be decent in melee, potentially even pull off a charge. And, and there are a lot of ways to make an Autark good in melee with relics that we've already talked about and some Warlord traits that we've already talked about. Uh, and the Warp Spider generator on the Autark, when you make a battle focus move, you can roll 2d6. So it, he can like teleport around the midfield a little bit like Nightcrawler, shoot something with that uh, Dragon Fusion weapon, teleport out of sight, next turn, make a 12-inch move really close to something, shoot it with the uh, fire dragon weapon at close range for the damage bonus charge stab it with a star glaive which is pretty good he's he's potentially a really useful midfield tool against opponents monsters and special characters and even heavy infantry in concert with other midfield units there's there's a lot of play there um he also has this ability now called uh superlative strategist which allows you to use command rerolls twice. I've already talked about why I don't think that's great. Um, and you can do that even when he's embarked on a transport. I don't think you're going to be putting him on a transport a whole lot. Okay, so I'll talk for just a moment about the Autark with wings. Uh, it can only have the stuff basically that's in the, the blister pack with it. So it can have a fusion pistol and a banshee blade and manda blasters and sweeping hawk wings. And if you want, your fusion pistol could instead be a shuriken pistol. You wouldn't do that. It's fine. I mean, if you were to use this guy, he would work in the same way as the the jump pack autark that I mentioned before. I would say, you know, go with you could you could take a relic weapon in place of the the banshee blade, and then he bops around the midfield, providing bonuses, shooting things with his fusion pistol, and charging at appropriate moments. It's just that he doesn't have the banshee mask to get all the to shut down Overwatch and get the benefits from that, and the dragon fusion gun is just significantly better than the fusion pistol, especially because it has range. So he's basically similarly pointed. He's just objectively worse. Um, 
I like the model. I'll get it on the table at some point, but I do think the other one is just kind of obviously better. The The real issue I think with the Autarchs is that the Autark Skyrunner is a flat 100 points and it, it already has mo more mobility once the game, once it's on the table than either the Warp Spider Autark or the Swooping Hawk Autark because it's a, it's a 16 inch move. It has more toughness at four, more wounds at six. Uh, it, it already shoots and fights pretty much as well as these others, you know, so you don't have the dragon fusion gun. Uh, you could take it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Um, but you do have four upgraded shuriken catapults and a laser lance, which is strength six minus four flat two. So it doesn't hit really big targets quite as hard, but still that's a solid shooting profile that will be a significant threat to most opponents. And then in melee, it hits super hard with a bunch of attacks. It's, it's just, it's really good. Uh, and if you wanted to take the relic sword, you could instead of the laser lance give him a banshee blade. But I, I would stick with the laser lance. Uh, at a hundred points, instead of one hundred and thirty-five, which is about where the other ones are coming in, I, I think it's probably generally going to be the better play. The one thing you do move that that two d six battle focus move that the autark has that's really cool. Uh, but you could use a stratagem to battle focus him six anyway. So I don't know. Autark Skyrunner, I think, is probably the stronger pick. Okay, Phoenix Lords. We'll talk about the Phoenix Lords. So all of the Phoenix Lords are universally better. They are objectively very good. They all have this ability called Favorite of Cain, which gives them a four up, a minimum of a four up invuln, and they can never lose more than three wounds in a single battle round. That's really good. It means that your opponent can't just shoot the crap out of your Phoenix Lord with high damage weapons and and wipe it, they've got to be able to do three damage in shooting and three damage in melee, and all of the additional damage is just lost. And even if they do manage to take a Phoenix Lord out uh, on a four plus, your Phoenix Lord using the Phoenix Reborn stratagem, which I talked about in an earlier video, just comes back with D3 wounds. So they're pretty sticky and they all have good combat chops. I think that they all function a bit differently from one another in terms of how you'd use them on the table, which is appropriate, of course. Uh, and some of them definitely stand out above the others as good picks. We'll talk about Asserman first because he's first in the book. He's really good. And I think what Asserman is conceptually is an objective holding anchor point. Uh, he's on foot at seven inches. So, you know, you, you've, you're either going to put him in a vehicle or maybe you're going to quicken him on turn one if you want to get him onto a midfield objective. But he's more durable than the others because he has a three up invulnerable save, which is one of the few three up invulnerable saves now left in the game. Uh, so, I mean, think about that. If you pop lightning fast for one CP, then he's minus one to hit, three up and vuln, put fortune on him, five up, feel no pain, can't take more than three damage in a single round of combat, and you can resurrect him. That's so good. He's a 150 point objective anchor. Now, you could either use him to grab your backfield objective which I don't think is the strongest use, or you could get him onto a midfield objective, either again with Quickener out of a transport. Now, I think if you're planning to use Hidden Path, that stratagem that I talked about, uh, or secondary objective that I talked about in my previous video, that hugely rewards you for picking an objective in the midfield and controlling it, especially in the end game, but pretty much throughout the game, uh, this is, Asserman is a is great synergy in that list because if you put the buffs on him that I just suggested, he's enormously hard for your enemy to pick up. He's got objective secured. They all have objective, objective secured now. Somebody asked about this. All of the Phoenix Lords, because it doesn't say that on the sheet, but what it does say is that they each Phoenix Lord has a rule that grants obsec to units of their aspect shrine type within six inches, and every Phoenix Lord has the keyword for its own aspect shrine type. So they're all obsec. So he's just an enormously powerful obsec anchor and he's still he's still good in combat he was good before in melee he's still very good in melee uh his shuriken catapults he's got the bloody twins his wrist mounted shuriken catapults dire avenger shurikens well th those profiles got a boost just because dire avenger shurikens are better now so 24 inches great assault six strength four minus two ap and then flat two damage because it's Asserman. that's really good especially against heavy infantry. And then the Sword of Asser is plus two strength, so that's a six minus three AP, flat three damage, and on rolls of six, you inflict D3 mortal wounds. And because he does have strands of fate, you can guarantee rolls of six by using a fate die. And so that's that's 
badass. That's fantastic, right? He can be he can be a real melee monster, which is another reason why I think he's really good on a midfield objective. Now, uh, previously, people were using Empower, the Psychic Power, to give Astroman a 1 in 3 chance of doing Mortal Wounds, and also just to make him better at wounding things, because the ability did not read Unmodified Roll of 6 for the, the Sword of Aser. Uh... That is doubly not okay now because A, the power no longer can be used on characters and B, it does say unmodified. So that's gone, but he's still he's still super solid. No Phoenix Lord can take a Warlord trait. They cannot take uh, relics and none of them have the craft world bonuses because if you look at their data sheets, they don't have a keyword for your faction. But the data sheets on their own are so good that arguably that doesn't really matter. The other thing that would make Asterman insanely sticky is if you were to cast Enervate on whatever is engaged with him so it keeps getting minus one to the wound roll, you could make him just an absolutely insane midfield tar pit that also is really good in combat. Baharath, my personal uh, favorite just for just for the play style here. It's, he's, he's so cool. So they, they all have, a, a I think, the same stat line. Two up weapon skill, two up ballistic skill, Strength four, toughness four, six wounds, six attacks, leadership nine, two plus. But Baharath, because he has his swooping hawk wings on there, has a 14-inch move. And what Baharath is, is a harassing and scoring unit. So uh, he has sudden assault, like swooping hawks. So you can bring him in from deep strike. And then he has this power called Cloud Strider, which enables him to either do the thing that all swooping hawks can do. So when swooping hawks make a battle focus move, this is crazy. When we get to hawks, I'll talk about this. I think they're so good in this new codex. Uh, instead of battle focusing D6 inches, you can pick up the swooping hawks and redeploy them as though they were coming in out of deep strike anywhere on the board nine inches from enemy models. So he can do this too. But then in addition to that, he can do that when he consolidates. So that means that you can have Baharath like stay out of line of sight in your backfield. Your opponent moves into the bit midfield. He jumps into the midfield, shoots something with the Fury of the Tempest, which is range 24, assault 4, strength 6, minus 2 AP, flat 2 damage, and unmodified hit rolls of 6 automatically wound the target. And then charge with the Shining Blade, 6 attacks, Strength 5, minus 3 AP, flat 2 damage, and every unmodified hit roll of 6 scores an additional hit. And then before your opponent hits you back, you just pick him up and put him somewhere else. He can either go hide in your backfield again or in the late game. He can hide in your opponent's back backfield and help you score uh, behind enemy lines or land on an objective that your opponent leaves undefended. He, he's an incredible resource for harassing and scoring. So good. Fugin. Fugin is exactly as you would expect him to be the, as the fire dragon phoenix lord. He is uh, a powerful anti-tank and monster tool. I will say that I actually think Fugin is arguably uh, one of the weaker includes, and, and this is in a field of very strong includes. So, you know, he's still totally usable and still good, but uh, I'll get to why in a minute. He, he does have plus one strength and plus one toughness over the other phoenix lords. So he's Strength 5, Toughness 5, which is great. The Seer Song, his relic weapon, has two different profiles. One is a lance profile, 18 inches assault, one strength 10, minus 4 AP, D6 plus 4 damage. No abilities, it's just a really hard-hitting fire lance that does D6 plus 4 and wounds pretty much everything on a 3-up or better uh, that will go through most armor. Or the beam which is only 12 inches, strength 6, minus 3, flat 4, but like the Avatar sword, everything that you can draw a line to between you and the target that you're shooting, uh, you, you make a wound roll against the hull. And then he's got a fire axe, which is his strength, strength 5, minus 4 AP, flat 3 damage. Um, so pretty, pretty solid in melee. That hits pretty hard. Uh, he has, and then he has the assured destruction ability, so when you're making ranged attacks against vehicles or monsters, you reroll room rolls of one, and he has something called unquenchable resolve. While he's lost any wounds, you add one to the strength and attack characteristics uh, of the model. Now he's he's good, he's solidly good, but the the sink the. There's really just one reason that I'm not totally sold on him. Again, he's movement seven, so you've either got to stick him in a transport probably or quicken him, or I guess you could bring him in out of deep strike, but. My, my issue 
here is um, that he's 160 points and both of his shooting profiles are assault one. And, and yes, potentially you could draw a line through most of multiple units, but I don't, I don't see that being hugely useful a lot. And that lance hits really hard, but it could easily just ping off an opponent's invulnerable save, which would then be disappointing. Yeah, I guess he could still charge, but at strength five on the fire axe, uh, big monsters and tanks, he's going to be wounding those on a five up unless his unquestionable, unquestionable, unquestionable resolve has been activated. And I don't like powers that rely on a model being wounded. And frankly, the simple fact is that he's exactly the same price as a fire prism. And the lance profile on the fire prism has uh, is just better than this. It's fires twice instead of once, is strength 14 instead of strength 10, is AP minus 5 instead of 4, and does 3d3 damage, which is a lot. Uh, his damage profile probably has a slight statistical edge, but it's a lot. And then you have access to the linked fire stratagem if you have two prisms, which lets you just ignore invulnerable saves. So it has twice the rate of fire on its its better profile, and it can hit anything anywhere on the board, and he has to be within 18 inches. Uh, and also the character slots are so precious that I I think, again, there's probably some Fugan fans out there who are maybe disappointed, but I, I, he's still good. Like, you can definitely use him, and you can definitely use him in competitive games. I just think that he's not the most optimal pick for his points, given those limitations. Uh, Jane Czar. I love Jane Czar. I'm an, as you all know, I'm, I suspect by now I'm an Ibrisil player. And so Howling Banshees, that's, that's my bag. And Jane Czar is so cool. I am also delighted that after the model came out and she had a lackluster profile, we finally have a profile for Jane Czar that will make us want to put her on the table. And like Banshees themselves, Jane Czar is a uh, shock assault infantry, fast shock assault infantry. And she's particularly good at picking up objectives off of opponents because she excels at killing heavy and light infantry in relatively significant numbers. She's pretty quick. And unlike Banshees on their own, she's OPSEC. So, uh, so she's pretty solid. She has the standard Phoenix Lord profile, except she has a move of eight instead of a move of seven. Uh, and then she has Terror's Lament, which is just a really good Banshee Mask. It does all the things that Banshee Masks usually do. Shuts down Overwatch, shuts down Set to Defend, uh, inflicts Fight Last. But it also does something that all Banshee Masks appear to have done previously in uh, some earlier playtesting version of the Codex based on the Eldritch Omens box set. That is... When she's within engagement range of an enemy, any enemy unit in that circumstance suffers minus one to its attack characteristic, which really can cripple an opponent's ability to hit you back in melee if, you know, there are five models in that unit and they each have three attacks, you're eliminating a third of their attacks. If they have two, you're cutting in half. That's uh, that's great. I, I especially like that thing, that sort of thing against elite heavy infantry, like space marines that just, even when they're not melee units, they all have two attacks and because they're strength four, they can actually really rough Eldar up even without AP. Uh, the ability to cut their attacks in half, that's that's not nothing. Now, um, she's also got the typical Swooping Hawk acrobatic thing. So in melee, it's minus one to hit her. Uh, and nearby Banshees get the obsec. And, and all Aspect Warriors also get plus two to their leadership for, for being near their Phoenix Lord, which makes sense. I always thought it was a little bit weird in 8th Ed that the... the Aspect Warriors next to their Phoenix Lord are no braver than Aspect Warriors not next to their Phoenix Lord. So I, I like this. I think it makes sense. Her weapon profiles are much improved, and she obviously depends on these because her abilities are all solid, but, you know, on their own. Uh, they're, they're support powers. The Silent Death, her twirly Triscale throwy blade, is Assault 6. Strength 6, minus 3 AP, flat 1. So that really stings now. You know, she's she can she can really lay out an infantry squad fast. She gets close to you, and the first thing that she does is hits you with six shots that are hitting on twos and wounding strength three infantry on twos and going through most armor. Uh, and then when she charges, she has two different profiles for the Blade of Destruction. One is for heavy infantry and arguably monsters, and the other one is for light infantry. So piercing strike is the one for heavy infantry. She gets plus two to her strength, so that's strength six. So again, against any heavy infantry in the game, she's going to win them on a three up, 
uh, light infantry obviously choose there. Um, and then minus three AP, so it pretty much goes through any armor, and then flat two damage. So heavy infantry with two wounds, she's just picking those models up. And then sweeping blow is the other option. It's uh, strength user, so four. But if you're dealing with a whole bunch of Tyranid Gaunts or a big unit of Guardsmen or Chaos Cultists or something, uh, AP minus three, it'll just ignore any armor on light infantry. And then it's flat one damage, but you're doubling the number of attacks. So she's rolling 12 attacks for this on top of the silent death attack. That's 18 attacks, all of which hit on twos. Uh, she could pretty reliably wipe any squad of light infantry unless it has a good invuln. Um, and certainly five model squads of heavy infantry, you can probably count on the same thing. Um, and then with the OPSEC thing, obviously it helps if she can pick up an objective. She's also reasonably tar pity with the minus one to hit, two up save, four up invuln, and the lowered attack characteristic. So the other use for her is to tie up a powerful enemy melee character, like a demon prince or something. Um, and again, Phoenix reborn. So even if they do manage to take her out, which is hard when you can't do more than three damage to her in melee. And if you're right on top of her, it's going to be hard to shoot her. Uh, you can just resurrect her. So anti-infantry, objective assault slash tar prit, pretty solid. She's cheaper than most of the others at 140. Um, I think you probably are looking at starting her off in a transport. If you have uh, a falcon with five banshees in there, you can also stick her in. Or obviously if you have those two extra spots and a wave serpent on top of a 10 elf squad or five wraith blades or something she could go in there too and i think that's probably how she wants to get on the board and ghost walk is always there if you need to help her pull off a charge but she's pretty solid pretty pretty good i don't think she's one of the i think Baharath and asserman are really good i i think that she is and all arguably also uh karen dross she is very good um i definitely plan to use her even if she's not the very best of the phoenix lords Okay, Karen Dross, Striking Scorpion Phoenix Lord. Uh, this guy's really cool. So he's got the typical profile. And his whole deal is that he is uh, a, essentially a part of a, a blitz melee attack. So if you are planning to hit your opponent potentially with multiple units of of blitz melee troops on, on turn one, so maybe you have a couple of units of Striking Scorpions that you are setting up with advanced positions nine inches from your opponent's deployment zone, and then maybe also setting up Karen Dross. And if you get first turn, they get to move seven inches and then charge, so they're they're going to succeed. Uh, before your opponent even takes a turn, your opponent's getting absolutely mauled by very competent melee troops. And then if you don't get first turn, you use Phantasm to pick up the two units of Scorpions and Karen Dross. I'm sure that there are other ways to use him too. And at some point when I do a unit focus video on Scorpions uh, and their Phoenix Lord, I will explore those. He so here's here's what makes him so scary. Uh, he has he has some shooting. He's got uh, Arahar's bane. It's twelve inches assault two strength five minus one flat two damage shuriken. So on sixes, it's got better AP. You know that's fine. But then his his melee profile is really good. Like Jane Zari, he has both an anti horde and then an anti like heavy infantry melee profile. Uh, but his melee profile also potentially threatens like larger monsters and can even do some damage to tanks. The The harder hitting one is strength times two. And because he starts at a four, well, it's it's strength eight minus four AP. So it goes back through anything without a melee save, flat two damage. So if, if you jump a tank with him that uh, that doesn't have an invuln save, he's, he's wounding that thing on four up, going through its armor and doing flat two damage for each thing, for each hit, excuse me. And with a weapon skill of two, and then these other abilities, potentially it's amazing. So he's got uh, his war gear, the Scorpion's Bite. It's like the Manda Blaster on the Striking Scorpions, but instead of an unmodified wound roll, wound roll of six inflicting one mortal wound, it inflicts two mortal wounds. And if you keep in mind that you have Strands of Fate, what this means is you attack whatever it is, maybe that, maybe that tank, and you're going to hit probably with pretty much everything. And then if you use a couple of Fate dice to get mortal wounds, each of those fate dice is is a is a hit that goes straight through normal armor, doing flat two damage, but delivering an additional two mortals immediately. So if you have two fate dice to use on this, uh, that that's a that's an eight that's eight damage on a vehicle, not even taking into account those other attacks that may very well have 
succeeded. Or he could just wreck heavy infantry or, frankly, light infantry. Um, and he's not that much slower than Jane Czar with that, uh, with that move of seven. So he's, his sustained assault power also means that unmodified hit rolls of six score an additional hit. Now, these additional hits don't stack with Scorpion's Bite, but that is just more damage. And that one's particularly going to come into play when he uses his other weapon, uh, is your mathel, and someone's going to correct me, and that's tragic and embarrassing, but that's that's how I'm saying it. Uh, that one is the anti like horde infantry, but it would also be decent against heavy infantry. And that comes in at strength six, minus two AP, and then each time an attack is made with this weapon, you make two hit rolls instead of one. So he's starting by rolling 12 dice, and so that just makes the that Manda Blaster ability, uh, the Scorpion's Bite ability, uh, that much more likely to succeed. He's going to hit really, really hard. He's going to be hungry for Stands of Fate dice, and then he's not going to be as sticky as Jane Czar because he's not minus one to hit in melee. Um, you can, and he doesn't reduce their attack characteristic, but my goodness, he's a, he's a powerhouse, especially once you start re resurrecting him with Phoenix Reborn. Really solid pick, really good Phoenix Lord. And lastly, uh, Morgan Ra, your long-range, heavy support Phoenix Lord that may want to squat on your backfield objective. He's good. Um, I, I would say that he's good because they're all good, but I would say that uh, he and Fugan are probably probably bringing up the rear. Um, so he's got the standard uh, stat line, and then inescapable accuracy. He ignores dense cover, so units behind dense cover don't get minus one to hit. And Doom Incarnate, when he when when your opponent is uh calculating for uh morale tests every more every unit killed by morgan raw counts as two units for the role potentially against particular kinds of enemy with like very high cost somewhat expected expensive heavy infantry that might really matter um but it's it's a little situational for sure sometimes it's going to be great the weapon uh his relic weapon has two profiles one is a melee profile. We're not terribly interested in that. He's not going to be getting into melee. It's strength six, minus two, flat two damage, six attacks. If, it basically means that if you wanted to use him in the midfield, you could, and he would have some chops, but there are much better midfield Phoenix Lords. Uh, and then his, his relic shooting profile is 36 inch range. That's great. Assault six, strength seven, not quite getting to the eight, which is sad, um, but good against light tanks, monsters, and heavy infantry, minus two AP, flat two damage, and unmodified wound rolls of six inflict a mortal wound. I think the move here, because he can only take three damage per phase, and because you have the Phoenix Reborn stratagem, the move with this guy really is to stand him on your, and because he's obsec, the move with this guy really is to stand him on your backfield objective, give yourself some long range fire support and rely on his Phoenix Lord durability to keep him in the game for a while. All that said, uh, he's 150 points. Again, you're 10 points off being able to get, you know, a fire prism, or you could get a night spinner, or you could buy a bunch of support platforms, or frankly, a couple of walkers with bright lances. His his damage output is not equal to to what you can get from, from similar models. Yes, he can benefit from Lookout Sir for a little while. Uh, I think if you need something in that backfield role and you happen to have an, a free HQ slot and 150 points, he's he's not a bad pick, but um, I don't think he's one of the stronger picks. I'm, I'm, I'm doubting that even though the new model is super freaking cool, uh, I don't expect him to see a lot of play in my lists except when I'm playing narrative games and like tripling down on having lots of Phoenix Lords and telling a cool story. Okay, the Spirit Seer. The Spirit Seer is a psychic support HQ infantry unit that buffs wraiths and also provides some general psychic support. If you are running a lot of wraiths in your list, uh, you're leaning into, say, a big hammer and anvil unit of wraith blades, or you're relying on uh, a number of wraith lords or something like this, I think you do want a Spirit Seer, even though these HQ slots are precious and it can be difficult to find the slots that you need. There's one other circumstance in which you might want this model that I will that I will also talk about. So the stat line has stayed pretty consistent, two up weapon skill and ballistic skill, four wounds, pretty durable for Craft World's HQ. It's got the four up invuln. The 
offensive capabilities are nothing to write home about. Two attacks, shark and pistol, the witch staff still does what it's always done, wounds on twos, d3 damage, but it's now got AP minus one. So it's kind of fine in melee, but definitely not really worth thinking about or discussing too much. Um, the, the spirit here does two things for you. One, the spirit host, or the spirit mark ability allows spirit host core units within six inches to reroll wound rolls of one. So this also affects wraith lords, which do have core and certainly all of the wraith guard and wraith blades. And that's really, really good. It remains to be seen whether Wraith Seers will be given core or not. If they end up being like Wraith Lords, yes, and we don't know. But uh, it's really good. It's, the Spirit Mark is way better than it used to be. Everybody was misreading Spirit Mark for years into the last edition. They thought that it let you reroll ones to hit if you were within six inches of the target unit. It let you reroll with ones to hit if you were within six inches of the target that the Wraiths were fighting. So it only worked really for Wraith Blades, and only if the Spirit Seer was pretty close to the front of the unit, like just behind the front line or something. So not, you know, it, it was, it was, it worked. It was solid for that one thing, but this is much, much better. Um, it makes stuff like a couple of Bright Lances on your Wraith Lords. They're probably only going to fail to wound most of the time um, on, well, no, if you shoot hard targets, ones, twos, even threes, but the ability to reroll ones to, to wound there is pretty solid. So it's, it's just a solid buff to make Wraith units more reliable. And if you think about how it stacks with other buffs, it's even better. So for example, if you're running Ulthway and you have a Spirit Seer near some Wraith units, well, Ulthway units, the unit gets to reroll one failed wound roll. So if you've got a Spirit Seer there, that means your Wraiths, nearby Wraiths reroll all of their ones and then like one, two or three if the threes fail to wound somehow. Uh, that's a pretty significant damage multiplier. And you can also put things like guide on wraiths or or wraith lords. So it, there's there's an opportunity to do some serious damage multiplication on what is one of the hardest hitting units that we have access to. Uh, that That's really good. So again, if you're running a lot of wraiths, it makes sense to have a spirit seer. The other thing the spirit seer does is the psychic support. It can take a, paddle, a power from the runes of battle or the runes of fortune. The obvious thing is to take something that's going to help your wraiths out. So uh, maybe you really want to put protect on your wraiths in order to get them to two, a two up save. This could be particularly strong if you're playing Eandon because now your wraiths have a two up save and they ignore minus one AP that, that and minus two is reduced to minus one. So even on wraith units that don't have the invuln save, even if you're not running the the wraith blades uh, with the with the shields, they can be super super durable. Uh, just that's a great synergy. If you need to quicken your wraith blades because they're slow, uh, this is a pretty good way to do that. If you need to cast ghost walk on wraith blades coming in and out of the webway, um, having a spirit seer on the board to help you do that just makes sense. The the and I said there's a, a circumstance in which you might consider the rate the spirit seer even if you're not leaning into the wraiths, and it's if you really need to find a way to fit a runes of fortune cast into your list, and you can't afford to give up one of your far seers casts because uh, I misspoke in when I was talking about psychic powers in my previous video. I said anybody with runes of battle can swap them out for the runes of fortune. That's not true. Warlocks can't do that. Uh, warlocks are locked into the runes of battle, as is the hemlock wraith fighter, which I sometimes don't remember as a caster. Um, if you want access to the Runes of Fortune, you either have to give up a Farseer power or the Spirit Seer can do it, or uh, you can do it by including some Corsair Elites, but those Corsair Elites, even the cheapest build to get a Runes of Fortune power is 85 points and the Spirit Seer is 70. Yes, it takes up an HQ slot, they don't, uh, but nevertheless. So it's a solid unit. The, the one, I think, obstacle to the Spirit Seer is that there's no way to put him on a jet bike, so he's got a seven inch move and getting around to be in range of the things that you need to cast on could be a little tricky. One option is to put him in a transport. Uh, I will say though that because wraiths are slow with a five inch move, if you quicken the wraiths and advance the spirit seer, uh, especially if you use like a fate die to make sure he gets a full advance so he moves 13 inches, he, he can keep up with them just fine. So, so that's the spirit seer. Let's talk troops. Okay, so some of my fellow content creators have pronounced uh, Eldar troop slot units uh, attacks still. And this is something that people were saying back during the when the 8th edition codex was still current, was that the troops just weren't good enough and not efficiently pointed enough 
especially after the big nerfs that came at the beginning of ninth edition to rangers for those to feel like anything other than attacks and what that means is that you don't really want these things in your army but you have to to fill out battalions they haven't been made good enough to have an important role to play uh at their point cost and i think that this is an overly gloomy view of what's in the codex i completely understand the perspective absolutely no disrespect to other content creators but i do have a slightly different perspective on this I, I think that rangers are excellent and probably all of us are going to want at least two squads of them i think that guardian defenders uh in an eandon list an ulthway list or a custom craft world list using hail of doom completely earn their keep as a combat unit, certainly a single squad of them. And in any other list where maybe you are taking a single unit of Guardian Defenders, an MSU 10 elf squad of Guardian Defenders just to fill out your battalion, they're not bad. Uh, they're fine. And having one is frankly useful. Um, 80 points is not, or 90 points, excuse me, is not, is just not terrible for that. And, and we'll go through and, and talk about why. So Guardian Defenders are objectively better than they used to be. They still come in squads of 10 to 20 with 0 to 2 heavy weapons platforms, 1 per 10 Guardians. Except all of the heavy weapons, as I talked about in my first thoughts video, uh, now hit catastrophically harder than they used to, so they're much better. And Shuriken Catapults now have an 18-inch range and minus 1 AP. Now, when Phoenix Rising came out and it was possible to do custom craft worlds with uh, superior shurikens and I think it was called Hail of Doom, uh, you could essentially build a worse version of these guardians and people were using them. You could, so they had a 16 inch range and minus one AP and there were, and, and people were using them. And now they have an 18 inch range, a minus one AP, a four up save instead of a five up save. People are mad about it. Um, and that's just because everything else in the, in the codex is so good. Um, so here are some here are some uses I see for guardians in a in a combat role. If you are playing Eandon uh, and you run ten guardians with a platform with the shuriken cannon, and you either move them into a ruin or you move them onto an objective and cast protect on them, well now they have a two. If you take shots onto the platform, which starts with a three up save, protect or the ruin will take it to a two up save, and then in Eandon you get to ignore minus one AP and reduce minus two AP to minus one. So you could have a group of guardian defenders sitting on an objective, ignoring minus one AP, uh, for uh, what is that? One hundred and ten points. It's not. That's not bad. And you can do other things like pop lightning fast and make the minus one to hit. That that's that's a a reasonably durable unit for the points. Now we have lost Celestial Shield. That is a blow. Uh, that was the uh, the stratagem that let you give them a four up invuln save against shooting only, but then with protect, you could get it to a three up and make a single unit of guardians pretty durable. Uh, that's a shame, but I think that that is counterbalanced to some degree by some some other possible bonuses. They also have this ability defenders when they're sitting on an objective, they automatically reroll hit rolls of one with their with their shuriken weapons. So that's cool. In an Ulthway list, you can bring a big blob of guardians in out of deep strike uh, to blast something by putting them in the webway. And then if you pop the Ulthway power discipline of the black guardians, they all hit on twos. So a maxed out unit, even before you consider the platforms, are firing 40 times hitting on twos. And then if you use the martial citizenry stratagem, re-rolling ones. And if you consider that Shurik and Catapults now have a better range and that minus one AP, they're really tearing stuff up. If you cast Doom on the target, a unit of guardian defenders can kill like a tank. Because if you are wounding on fives, but re-rolling failed wounds, that's actually better than wounding on four up statistically. And it also gives you an opportunity to roll more sixes. And those, of course, are going to have minus three AP instead of minus one AP. That will really, really tear stuff up. And just 20 guardians with no platforms, 180 points coming in at a deep strike. 180 points is not uh, ridiculous for a combat unit with 20 wounds and some, some real murder power. And now you can put them far enough from an enemy that they won't just immediately get mauled in melee because they can, of course, be 18 inches away and then they can battle focus even further away. So th there is play there. Absolutely. If you're running them with uh, the custom craft world power, Hail of Doom, and all of your sixes to hit auto wound and count as sixes to wound and you cast guide on them, then you, you know, you roll 40 dice if it's a big unit, you get a bunch of sixes, those all wound automatically at minus three, and then you roll all of the fail, the, the ones that missed, and you get a bunch of sixes again, and then you roll the wound, and you get yet more sixes. And so 
you've got all of these auto wounds coming in at minus three, you can really tear something up, even a pretty freaking hard target. Uh, and so that if you're using guardians in that third troop slot, they're doing some real work for you. The last uh, point that I'll make is because they're a core unit and because they can take heavy weapons, this is this is one of the one of the only ways to give significant to give rerolls to heavy weapons platform. I'm overstating it a little bit because, um, well, I'll just say we can't give rerolls to our vehicles as easily as we used to be able to because vehicles are not core units, so they don't benefit from the autark, and vehicles do not benefit from any of the psychic powers, all of which require even Doom requires the unit making the reroll to be a core unit. So Doom and Guide are off the table. Uh, so you still can give rerolls to vehicles with um, the Beltan and Ulthway sub-faction bonuses. Ulthway rerolls a wound, uh, Beltan rerolls a hit roll, but that's only one die for the whole squad. But if you do have something like a, uh, a Bright Lance on a platform or a couple of Bright Lances on platforms, the ability with like guide and doom to give those things rerolls is not terrible. I don't think giving bright lances to your guardians is a great idea, but if you were looking for a way to get a bright lance into a list and, and it was the right list, potentially that could be really solid. And lastly, if you're even if you're not running any of the craft world options that I just talked about, it, you 10 guardians with no platform that start in your backfield and on turn one perform knockman data and then kind of keep their heads down until turn three or four when your opponent's army is thinned out a little bit and they pop out to grab an objective with obsec or they pop out of a ruin to put 20 shuriken shots shurikens are better now on some enemy unit that's that's moved forward and then they fire and fade it's not bad it's 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 solid so uh i don't think we need to be as gloomy about uh, troops as people think all right let's talk about that was a long that was a long-winded bit about Guardians. Let's talk about Rangers. Uh, Rangers are way better. They no longer deep strike for free, but they have this new power advanced position, so you can set them up in the midfield at least nine inches away from enemy units. Uh, the Long Ranger rifle is better. It's the rifle we all know and love from before, but now it has minus one AP. It still can ignore lookout, sir, and it's still on sixes to wound inflicts a mortal wound. But even though the profile has only changed in a small way, minus one AP, which is, I mean, I say small, but it's statistically big, uh, because of the new strands of fate power, you can always guarantee, if you have rolled any fives, I think it is, uh, you can guarantee that one of your rangers will will trigger that or more than one if you have multiple fives. So if you need to put a final wound on a character or your... your uh, there are curiously a lot of ways in this codex to death by a thousand cuts mortal wound your opponent. I think it's something that the, the designers wanted to work in the 8th ed codex, but it just wasn't reliable enough with the scorpions and the swooping hawks and various other tricks. And, and I, I suspect that one of the things we're going to figure out in like six to eight months or a year is how this codex actually can sneakily put a lot of mortal wounds on stuff. I haven't quite worked it out myself yet, but, um, but I see a lot of opportunity to do, you know, a couple here and there with, and they can really add up anyway, tangent. Sorry. So, the long ranger rifle is better both because of the AP bonus and the ability to guarantee that you inflict that mortal wound, uh, which can really count when you just need to, to ding something for one more and you don't want to have to shoot it with heavy weapon or something to guarantee that you do. Even a strength eight or toughness eight target potentially can pop it with your rangers. So that's cool. There's war gear. There's a gloom field and there's a wire weave net and the ranger cloak has improved and I will talk about how in just a moment. I think broadly speaking, there's two ways to think about using rangers. One is as a backfield objective holder. If you have a unit of five rangers as a backfield objective holder, here's what you're probably going to do. You're going to give them the gloom field, which gives the entire unit the benefit of dense cover against models that are at least 18 inches away. And this is why I say this is a backfield objective move. Uh, and rangers used to be an objective holder at the beginning of 8th edition. And then that when they nerfed the cloaks, it didn't work anymore. So this is a way to do that yet again. So your unit of rangers jumps on an objective and the ranger cloak, as long as you're receiving some kind of cover bonus, gives you plus one to your armor set. So the gloom field makes you minus one to hit. The ranger, the ranger cloak then triggers off the gloom field, taking their armor save from a five to a four. That's pretty good. You can also do something like cast protect on them, I guess, if you really needed to, uh, and take them down to a three. Alternatively, if you move them into a ruin in your backfield, then you're not on an objective. 
uh, but they end up at a at a three up save because the way the ranger cloak is phrased, it doesn't say gives you the benefit of light cover. It says adds an additional plus one to any saving throw made against that attack, so it stacks on light cover. So in light cover, these guys have a three up save. If they also have the gloom field, they're minus one to hit, and for their points. That's actually reasonably durable. So that's one way to play them. Having a single unit of rangers in that role is pretty solid. I think what most of us are going to be doing is using them in the second way that I'm going to discuss, which is deploying them into the midfield before the game starts. And there are a couple of roles that they could play in the midfield. Uh, one is you to put them hopefully out of line of sight, maybe initially, but pretty close to your opponent's backfield and then use them as a screening unit. So if you get first turn, for example, you move them potentially forward to block opponent's units that want to move up the board. Um, you could potentially just create a little wall of rangers and prevent almost any of your opponent's units, if, if, depending on how you set this up, from getting more than two inches out of their own deployment zone. And that honestly might be worth sacrificing the units in certain matchups. It's also a way to screen your backfield units from aggressive, fast enemy melee units. To be fair, that cannot fly. Uh, there's a cool trick you can do if you start rangers behind a ruin and then you move them into the ruin, but you leave less than an inch of space between the wall of the ruin and the rangers on the front end, which makes it very hard for anybody uh, or, or like exactly an, an inch such that the so you want to set it up. It's really, it's a little tricky, but it's totally doable. You want to set it up so that somebody who's up against the wall of the ruin, uh, because the wall of the ruin has a width itself, is not quite within one inch of the rangers. So people moving up to the edge of the un of the ruin are not engaged with the rangers. But anybody who moves into the ruin, well, unless they can run around behind the rangers, there isn't quite enough space for their bases. And this is a way to make it difficult for your opponent to engage them in melee and have to shoot them. And then they're benefiting from the three up armor save and you could always pop lightning fast if you need to. You can just make them really irritating to get rid of. You can also give them the wire weave net, which means that anybody who does try to charge them gets minus two to their charge and takes D3 mortal wounds on a two plus. Uh, that's really solid too. The other thing you can do is have them grab midfield objectives before the game even begins or uh, on your first turn. The reason to do it before the game even begins arguably is that there is there are some missions in which you only generate cp if you hold an objective that's not in your own backfield so this is a way to get a cp on the first turn uh there's just there's a lot of like janky movement shenanigans with these guys before the game starts that can make a huge difference in the outcome i played again a game against orcs last week in which I was able to position my rangers in a way that was just completely maddening for for my opponent and prevent his buggies and uh Gaskal Thraka from I, just kind of like bottling them up for a couple turns on one side of the board, board dealing with these. Yeah, the Rangers died, but I mean, the, the, the tactical advantage was huge. So, and obviously, if you're playing Alaytok Rangers, there are all sorts of other things that they can do that are super cool. I talked about some of that when uh, I talked about Alaytok. So, Rangers are good, they're reasonably efficiently pointed. I think. All of us are probably going to want, uh, almost all of us will want two squads of these guys and then probably round it out with defenders. And I say, when I say round it out with defenders, you're probably picking up what I'm putting down here with reference to Storm Guardians. Storm Guardians are bad. Uh, I'm going to say it. And I say this as somebody who likes Storm Guardians. I aesthetically, I like them better. I'm an Ibersol player. I figure most of my Guardians, if they were Aspect Warriors at some point, were Banshees. So they're going to be Storm Guardians, not Guardian Defenders. Um, they. In, in, a, in a minute, we're going to talk about uh, the Corsair Void Reavers, and I think one of the reasons that Storm Guardians aren't good is they needed to differentiate them in some way from Void Reavers, and I don't I don't think this quite worked. Uh, so here's here's the deal with Storm Guardians. They too now have a four up save, so that's better. Uh, they got rid of the really irritating rule where chain swords are objectively better than power swords or uh, um, Eldari blades, excuse me, but there are only two Eldari blades in the upgrade pack or only two chain swords in the upgrade pack. And so people are like cutting notches to try to turn their other swords into chains. Well, they got rid of all that. Now there's just something called a guardian close combat weapon, which means those of us who built with either guardian chain swords or guardian blades or, or whatever else. And it gives you a, a cool opportunity to like kit bash model something weird you could potentially model these things with all sorts of 
quirky craft world's weapons that you invented. And I think that's really neat. Uh, and what the, what that weapon does is it give it's, it's just strength user minus one AP, and then it lets you make an extra attack with the weapon. And that's supposed to balance out the fact that they have only one attack natively. Anytime, however, you, you have a melee dedicated melee unit that has one attack, uh, it's probably not much of a dedicated melee unit, especially when that attack is at strength three. And yes, they can now make two attacks at strength three with minus one AP. So they're just, it's just not great. There are, and, and they're, they're fragile. The, the, the idea here is that these are, these guys are supposed to be, they, they're storm guardians. They're supposed to assault enemies on objectives. They have an ability called storm blades in the same way that the guardian defenders have that ability that lets them re-roll ones to hit. If they're standing on an objective, their thing is they hold objectives. Storm guardians are supposed to take them. You get to re-roll ones to hit if you're on an objective with an opponent. Uh, but I struggle to imagine an opponent, maybe guardsmen, who are really going to have a problem being storm guardians uh, by 10 storm guardians. I mean, yes, if you run 20 of them, those attacks will add up, but 20 of them is 160 points if they have no upgrades. And there are better melee units that you could storm that objective with for 160 points for sure. Uh, so there are two ways that this is theoretically mitigated. One is you can give a couple of storm guardians and a 10 guardian unit flamers. So they've got some, they have just at that point, they would have 2d6 assault shots at strength four, no AP and they auto hit, but no AP. Uh, and that, and that costs you points. It raises the, the cost of the squad somewhat considerably. And then you can give two of them fusion guns. Now, fusion guns hit like a freaking truck. But two fusion guns in your Guardian Defender squad, or I'm sorry, your Storm Guardian squad at 10 points per fusion gun. Well, if even if you just do that, now the squad goes to 100 points. And for 100 points or slightly more than 100 points, you could get a better anti-hard target squad than storm guardians so having 10 guardians in the squad so you can use your two fusion guns is not terribly convincing they have access to you can give one an aldari power sword if you want to pay some points that's that doesn't swing it either uh in theory this is all supposed to be balanced out by the serpent shield the serpent shield is their version of the heavy support platform that Guardian Defenders can take. And it's such a cool idea. It looks like the old Epic 40K. Epic is a game that existed back around second and third ed where all of your infantry models were the size of like, I don't know, what is that size? Uh, a Tic Tac. Uh, and then tanks were the size of like your thumbnail and Titans were the size of models now. And it was a cool game. I really liked, I really liked Epic. Um, and the design of the Serpent Shield is definitely a call out to the early wave serpent, and that's neat. Theoretically, this is a defensive shield that keeps them alive while they move up the board to storm an objective. The problem is that it's not good. What it does is it gives the whole squad a five up invuln save, and then unmodified rolls of one or two will never will, ne will, will never wound. It's a transhuman physiognomy of a one and a two. If, the, if this thing had just been a four up invuln save only against shooting, I think there might've been an argument for using these guys. The problem is it like, so a lot of craft worlds players also collect some Slanesh demons for thematic reasons. Uh, if you have ever played with demonettes, you know what crappy objective holders they are. A single unit in your backfield that's mostly out of line of sight, sure. They're, and they're somewhat robust against light melee units, but like a five up demon save does not, make for on a t3 model does not make it tough and the only circumstance in which their version of transhuman matters is if they're being targeted by something of strength six or greater and then they still get wounded on a three up the squad will just get wiped it's not there isn't really a way to make these guys durable they don't hit very hard in melee and although you can kit them out with a bunch of weapons to make them an okay shooting threat they're not efficient compared to other shooting threats you can get for the same points. so i just i'm not sold I will still use them in narrative play. I love narrative 40K. I love my Storm Guardians. And I'm definitely going to model some with some quirky weapons. 
but I, I don't think they got there for making the cut. All right. The last troop slot is actually kind of my favorite just because it's flavorful in weird and interesting ways. And also I think it does have some play. Corsair Void Reavers. So these guys are super interesting. First of all, the models are just freaking gorgeous. You look at a squad of these things and the models themselves tell a story. You have your pirate captain and they're imposed in all of these interesting ways. If you go all the way back to the beginnings of 40K, Eldar, there were no craft worlds in first ed. They were Eldar were imagined as like traveling traders and pirates and essentially Tolkien space elves. Uh, at some time, so at some point, I'm going to do a retrospective on how the rules and lore have changed since First Ed, and I'll talk about that in great detail. It's it is an area of interest of mine. Uh, so Corsair Void Reavers, really cool thematic lore callback, and and Corsairs have been around all through. These guys are essentially probably what Storm Guardians should have been. So. Um, they do have melee chops. They're really cheap. My favorite thing about this is an MSU unit of Corsair Void Reavers is 50 points. And at 50 points, it hits way harder in melee than the the 10 model 80 point squad of Storm Guardians uh, because they're all equipped with power swords. So, and, and their sergeant actually has three attacks and they come natively with two. So five of these... Uh, Swashbuckly Eldar pirates, fifty-point unit charging an enemy. They, they've got. Uh, let's see, what is that? 11, 11 attacks, hitting on threes. Uh, strength four, minus four. I'm sorry, minus three AP. Eldari power sword, one damage, and unmodified sixes to hit automatically wound the target, and they get to shoot with their shuriken pistols first. So it's five shuriken shots that on sixes to hit automatically wound and count as sixes. So they get the minus three AP instead of the minus one. And then you put another 11 attacks into your op opponent that strength four and initial and sixes to hit will just auto wound them. And then most of those attacks are going to go straight through the armor or only be saved on a six. And for a 50 point unit, that's really good. That is a credible troops objective assault unit. That's like a trading unit. Uh, and they're just as durable as the storm guardians are without the serpent shield. And frankly, I don't want to spend 20 points to give these guys a five up in Vuln and a platform that, that floats around with them. I mean, it's just not really worth it. They're, they're, you want to keep your trading units as unbloated, as sleek and efficient as possible. And you can make these, if you need them to hit even harder, use psychic powers, you know, cast guide, uh, guide now affects melee units also. So they're, they're re-rolling they're, they're re their ones that choose to hit, and that gives you an opportunity to get some more sixes. Gast in power. Now they're at plus one to wound. You know, you, you could potentially stack some buffs on on your pirates to, to make a really sleek 50-point unit hit pretty damn hard in melee, uh, which is kind of how Eldar worked in 8th edition, and I think that's a really cool opportunity to have. Now, there is an opportunity to kit out this squad with all kinds of crazy bells and whistles. Uh, one in every five units, or one in every five models can have either a Corsair Blaster or Shredder. These are Drakari weapons. Uh, I think the idea here is that Corsairs are drawn from all walks of Eldar life, and they also steal stuff. And so they have a, a penelope of weapon options. This is cool. So this is the blaster is a Drakari weapon. It, it's strength eight minus four AP D six damage. And then the shredder is a salty six strength six minus one AP one blast. Uh, that's cool. You can give the sergeant a neuro disruptor that now what the neuro disruptor does is it's strength six minus three AP pistol one. And um, uh, if you're not targeting a vehicle, when you, when you, wound the target it, it takes a, a mortal wound um oh i'm sorry if it's just if you hit the target it takes a mortal wound my bad uh and and that's great it's a way to get around invuln say again I, I mentioned there's a lot of ways to like death by a thousand cuts opponents with invuln saves this goes through an invuln save one of them can take a wraith cannon which is crazy i i had always assumed that only wraiths were strong enough to pick those things up but it's also the, the model with it also just looks so freaking cool and and that's Strength 10, minus 4, D3, plus 3, 6 is to wound inflict mortals. So there are all kinds of ways to make the squad uh, hit even harder. 
you, you can also, instead of having them be a melee assault squad, you can turn them into essentially Corsair guardians and give them all at no cost. You can, you can trade their pistols and swords for uh, a shuriken rifle, which is a new thing. It's a rapid fire weapon. And for those craft worlds players who don't know what rapid fire does, because we've never had them before. If you're within half range, it doubles the rate of fire. So at 24 inches, this thing's fire fires one shot strength four minus one, one. It's basically a shuriken catapult that has a 24 inch range, but only has the rate of fire of a shuriken catapult if you're within 12. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a slightly better weapon if you're further away and it's worse, a worse weapon if you're closer. I honestly think that even though it's cool that they come with all of these neat bells and wisps. Oh, um, I mentioned that they're sixes to hit automatically when the target. I already mentioned that. So I, I, the problem is that these won't fill a troop slot. So you, you still need three from the other, uh, the other catalog. And then, and then they're competing with other stuff in your army. Um, I do think there's a really solid argument in certain lists for having uh, one to three squads of these guys just as cheap trading units and objective fodder. I mean, a 50-point obsec unit with real melee chops is no bad thing. Uh, if you if you can stick them in a transport, potentially they can jump out and do some work for you. It's it's it, I mean, it's a trading unit. I, I when I first read the codex. The role that I was most excited to see Corsairs in is in combination with the Webway Gate. The, the idea would be that you set the Webway Gate up near a midfield objective and you have two or three of these things just in reserve and you just keep irritating your opponent by jumping onto the objective with this incredibly efficiently pointed melee unit that just does some damage to whatever your opponent tries to move on to it and then obsect, obsects the objective away. Uh, but I, if if you've listened to all my videos, you've already heard me twice rant about why the Webway Gate may not be efficient. Basically, it comes down to terrain placement. I don't think you're going to be able to put it near an objective, and so I'm not sure they're going to work in that role. But uh, I, I do think people are going to come up with creative ways to use these. I'm definitely going to be playing around with them. And well, as soon as I get the I currently have no models for these, of course. But uh, when we get the models, all right, that's it for troops. Let's uh, let's talk about elites. The first elites option is the other Corsair unit, the Corsair Void Scarred. And this is some sort of elite Corsair unit that includes slightly better, a slightly better version of the, the Void Reavers. So they all get uh, it's the same it's the same stats really, but they get plus one attack. And then they've got the same sergeant as the Voids carried, the the Fellark, but he's got plus one attack too. So he's up to four attacks. The, the regular ones are at three attacks. That's cool. They come with the same basic loadout, by the way, and they cost two points more. So the, the Void Reavers are, are 10 per model. These guys are 12 per model. Uh, so initially, before I say anything else, one option is essentially, if you look at your Corsair Void Reavers and you say to yourself, you know what I'd be willing to pay 10 points more for? Five more attacks. You could just, you could just upgrade the squad and... Uh, and if you have 10 points left over at the end and, and you have a unit of these guys as a trading unit, it's maybe not a bad idea. But there are some other options here. You can also add into this squad 0 to 1 Shade Runners, 0 to 1 Soul Weavers, and 0 to 1 Way Seekers. And then uh, they've got some quirky abilities and war gear. So you could, you could kit, kit them out to be either... Uh, a sort of a generalist special a specialist generalist unit, even though that's a contradiction in terms, or you could choose just one of these things. The Shade Runner makes them hit a bit harder in melee, uh, although bizarrely comes with a, I, I think a slightly worse melee weapon. So, and, and these, by the way, all, co all cost more points. So, it's, I think a Shade Runner is eighteen. I think that's right. So, you're essentially think of it as upgrading one of your for for six more points. You're upgrading one of your dudes um, to a Shade Runner. Oh, and the, by the way, I might be wrong about this, but here's how I'm reading this. It says four to nine Corsair Void Scarred and one Void Scarred Fell Arc, but zero to one Shade Runners, zero to one Soul Weavers, and zero to one Way Seekers. The way some people might read that is you need to have five models in the unit before you can take any of those specialists. And the reason that I'm not reading that way, reading it that way, and I could be wrong, 
is simply that they all have the Corsair Void Scarred keyword. And so I assume that your Shade Runner, Soul Weaver, and Wayseeker do all count as Void Scarred. And so theoretically, uh, you don't need to start with five and then add those on. I think that's right. Maybe there's some sort of rare rule FAQ thing that someone's going to point out that I have it wrong. But um, but that's how I'm reading it at the moment. So you you theoretically could just be paying essentially six points to upgrade one of your Void Scarred to be a Shade Runner. And then you get this ability, Shade Runner Assault. Essentially, when, when you finish a charge move, you roll a d6 on a two to five, your enemy takes a mortal wound on a six, they suffer two. So you're paying six points to do some extra mortal wounds on the charge. And that's another one of those death by a thousand cut mortal wound abilities. That one comes with, instead of the Eldari Power Sword, though, paired Hecatari Blades, which are strength you deserve, minus three AP, one damage. So just objectively worse than the Power Sword because they're not strength four. So it's kind of weird that your your melee guy comes with the worst thing, but that's fine. It's uh it's flavorful. Cool, cool Drakari weapon there. Uh zero to one soul weavers. So the deal with the soul weaver is that it comes with uh this cool war gear item, channeler stones, which once per turn, when you, some model in the unit fails a saving throw, you can re reduce the damage characteristic to zero. That's really cool. Uh if you are doubling down on trying to make this unit durable. Potentially that makes sense. And in both this unit, by the way, also with the, the regular Corsairs, if you want, you can give the Sergeant uh, a Mist Shield for five points, which gives the squad leader uh, a four up invuln save. And so, the, the, I mean, the way I would think about that most of the time is you're paying five points, certainly for the regular Void Reavers, in order for the unit, if you need it, to have a four up save until the Sergeant dies, keeping in mind that the Sergeant only has one wound. It's kind of like what we used to do with the... Uh, Dire Avenger Exarch back in the day with Battle Fortune. So it's, you know, for five points. I, I don't, again, I think you're better off keeping those slim and trim and not spending a lot of points on them. But, but for the Voids card, if you are trying to build them out to do things, maybe it's worth the extra durability. And so I think what the Channeler Stones do for you is the first time you fail one of those saves, uh, you, you know, the, the, the guy lives and you and you, you keep, the, keep the bonus for a while. Um, your last option, zero to one Way Seekers, this is a Psyker. This Psyker gets either a, a, runes, a, a for, runes of Fate power, so a Farseer power, or one of those Runes of Fortune powers, which are quite useful. Uh, however, the Wayseeker is a little bit 25 points per model. So if you started this unit at 60 and you didn't want any... So 60 points, that's the cheapest version because 12 points per model. And you didn't want any special weapons of any kind, the, it's 85 points if you include the Psyker. And I'm honestly not sold on this simply because for five more points, you could have a, far, a foot Farseer who would have two Runes of Fate or one Runes of Fate and one Runes of Fortune Power. So I don't think it's an efficient way to get a, a Psyker into your army. I do think, however, if you're in a situation where you don't have another HQ slot and you need one more Farseer cast, that potentially it's not bad to take these guys with um, maybe the Mist Shield and the, the Channeler Stones to uh, be essentially a bodyguard unit for a, a, a Farseer and add another cast in there. And I, I don't know, there's probably a way to play it. But I am more excited about uh, the Corsair Void Ravers than I, are about the, I am about the Void Scarred because I, I do think as soon as you start trying to use any of the Void Scarred special stuff, they're just going to get prohibitively expensive for their durability and applicability. Oh, one more thing. You can you can buy for one model in the unit uh, a, a piece of word gear called a Falchu, obviously related to the same individual as Falchu's wing. Uh, and this allows you to pick an enemy unit and that enemy unit will not have the benefit of light cover against this particular Corsair unit. That's cool. It's flavorful. It's neat. I don't think it's worth 10 points. I mean, maybe if you've kitted the unit out with a bunch of really hard hitting weapons, but I, but again, I think the, the Voids card run into the same problem as the Void Reavers. And that is there, there is, is some aspect warrior that does that specialist target elimination job better, uh, at, at a more efficient point value. So, um, 
So these guys are neat. They definitely will have some some play and lists that need an extra cast, and there's probably ways to use them that I haven't thought of. But at the moment, I'm more excited about the, the troops version. Okay, Warlocks. I'm going to talk about Warlock Skyrunners and regular Warlocks in, at, at the same time, because they're the same unit. Really, it's just one's on a jet bike, and, and the units can be different sizes. So the way Warlocks have moved out of the HQ slot, we, we all know this, they've moved to the Elite slot, and they only take up an Elite slot if you don't have a Farseer in your army, or if you're taking more Warlock units than you have units of Farseers. They've also gotten the, right, the footlocks, anyway, have gotten cheaper. That's quite rare in this codex, uh, which is exciting. Foot warlocks in a, in a conclave are now only 20 points per model. Woo! However, if you start with only a single warlock, that single warlock costs as much as two, so it's 40 points per model, so that's as cheap as the unit can be. Uh, and then the advantage to that is that it gets the benefit of lookout, sir. So they don't get the character keyword unless you're taking only one, and then it does, but it's twice as expensive. And you can have a maximum of six foot locks uh, in a unit, and you could give them all a singing spear, but why would you? On the one hand, these are very efficiently pointed casters, and there's so many opportunities to use the runes of battle uh, that it would be great to have a bunch of warlocks in the list. And I think in 8th edition, I think if you look at the original point values for warlocks back in like the index, this is clearly what they were going for. Uh, and then, and then it ended up ended up not working out that way. I think the real problem warlocks face is not having access to lookout sir in a meta where there's an awful lot of very powerful indirect fire. They still have a four up invuln, but at the end of the day, they're T three with two wounds. It's it's pretty hard to keep these things alive. I, I think that uh, maybe it's going to be a little bit meta dependent how how much you want to lead into including warlocks in your list. If there's a lot of indirect fire in your meta, uh, they may just be too quick to die. There's probably also, if you've already got a wave serpent in your list uh, and you know you have, that can hold up to 12 models. So you could actually put two MSU, like aspect warrior units in a wave serpent and still have room for warlock conclave to keep them from getting killed on turn one if if that's a concern. Um, but that is that is clearly their greatest liability. I've, I've already talked about all the psychic powers, so I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about warlocks because that's really what they are, they're casters. I will just remind you, I had mentioned this before, that uh, the Seer Council has changed. So if you pay one CP for Seer Council, you need a conclave around your Farseer in order to make use of it. You pay it, one, you pay, pay it once at the beginning of the game for one CP, and it only gives plus one to the Farseer cast. It doesn't also benefit the Warlocks, but they get this body, bodyguard ability where if your enemy had some power that ignored Lookout Sir and targeted your Farseer, uh, they still would have to kill the Warlocks first. That's good. It's not amazing. Um, Warlock Skyrunners are, I think, a bit better uh, for the reasons that they've always been a bit better. They're tougher, they have more wounds, and they're faster. They, the limiting factor, they made it interesting, though, because some of the the, the cool stuff, like Battle Psychers, the, the stratagem that allows Warlocks to cast both versions of a Runes of Battle power, you need four models in the unit, and Warlock Skyrunner units are now limited to three. So they've incentivized using the footlocks in order to make use of that. And I, I think that's cool. I think that creates an interesting decision for us to make, as nice as it would be to have Skyrunners that could use that. Uh, Skyrunners, however, are at 35 points per model. That, that, is, a, that is a lot uh, for a, to climb on a jet bike. But, you know, having T4 and three wounds is a big difference between two wounds and three wounds in terms of what can kill you. Uh, T4 is obviously desirable, but most importantly, these things can be where you actually need them to be while staying out of line of sight of the enemy. So I I do think Warlock Skyrunners are worth the extra points. Um, I will say, I, I think Skyrunners are probably dead as a combat unit. There was a way before, if you, you may remember my, my video or my article about big unit like nine elf Skyrunner units that could make use of uh, Hunters of Ancient Relics to get to three attacks and you cast all these psychic powers on them. I, that's, we're not, we're not there anymore. These really are, a, and it's just, these, these are a support unit. There's no, there's no way to, the Singing Spear also is, so the, the Witchblade got a bit better. It now does flat two damage instead of D3 and it has a minus one AP before it had nothing. Uh, and unmodified rolls of two up are always successful. That's always been the thing with witch weapons. So that's cool. 
the singing spear got better in that it went up to flat three damage instead of d3, but there's no AP. Maybe there probably is a way. You know, I say there's no combat role for warlocks, but there, I guess you could kit out a six elf regular warlock foot squad, jump them out of a vehicle, cast Jinx on something to basically give the singing spear a minus one AP. And the flat three damages really could add up. Like that could be good. And I, I guess you could do that also with a unit of three Warlock Skyrunners. So never say never. But uh, I I don't think that's where to... If, if you're trying to figure out the codex for the first time, I, I think that that's, uh, that's some tricky stuff that maybe we, we try out in a, in a few months or or a year. Um, clearly, these, these are intended to be support units. They work quite well in that role. Now, if you run slightly larger conclaves, there's still the thing where you get more power. So if there are at least three Warlock Skyrunners, you can get two uh, powers from the Runes of Battle, which is good, and you can manifest an additional one. That's solid. It's a reason to take an extra bike in that conclave. Um, I think probably you're probably either taking three or one, right? Because either, and again, you have to pay you have to pay more if you're taking a single Skyrunner. It's not it's not double like it is with the foot warlocks but it's 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 60 points so that's not nothing so i think you're either taking a single one with 60 points that benefits from lookout sir or you, you probably are taking three and getting the extra cast uh because at two you're just you're giving up lookout sir and you're not getting an extra cast uh i not totally sold on that one um the foot warlocks can go even to, to two powers also, but they need four models to do it. Uh, and again, that's probably something to think about doing if you're going to order a lot. So, so there it is. Um, if, if you're interested in how to use Warlocks, well, you can listen to my Runes of Battle Psychic uh, bit again. They're pretty solid. Dire Avengers. Dire Avengers are so good. Oh my goodness. It's I, I will say the thing that everybody else has said. It is, from a competitive perspective, sad that they're not still a troop unit. But I, I have to say, from a lore perspective, I, I get it. They are... They are the elite version of the, the the generalist troop. I think they probably do just from a lore perspective belong in elites. Uh, so in order to distinguish them from guardians, which has always been a little tricky, they have gone to they, they, the, the dire Avenger shirt and catapult is has, which has always been better is now even more betterish than the, the guardian one. So the guardian one went to uh, 18 inches Assault 2, minus 1 AP. This is at 18 inches. Assault 3, minus 2 AP Shuriken. And that means on 6 is to wound, your Dire Avengers are are coming in at minus 4 AP. Because the way the Shuriken ability works now is not that it's just a flat minus 3 on a 6. Now it's an additional minus 2 to whatever it was before. So on 6s, they're just, they're going through pretty, they're going through power armor, right? That's really good. There are only 12 points per model. So an MSU unit of these things is coming in at 60 points, which is very efficient. Uh, and they benefit from, and all of the crazy shuriken builds, like the Hail of Doom build, uh, they're they're going to really tear stuff up. And they've got some cool Exarch powers, which we'll look at in a moment. The Dire Avenger Exarch still has, oh, they all have two attacks, by the way. Aspect Warriors all have two attacks, kind of like Space Marines. They're, they're just better, they're better in melee, and that's cool. The Dire Avenger Exarch has the option of either a second catapult or a... Uh, one of those melee weapons, right? The power glaive, they both changed. The power glaive is plus two strength. So coming in at a five, minus two, flat two. I mean, Exarch has three attacks, no joke. And then the dire sword is plus one. Each time an attack made with this weapon successfully wounds the target, suffers one mortal wound. That's again, that death by a thousand cuts, mortal wound thing. So you don't, you don't have to worry about armor saves at all. That's pretty cool. Uh, between the two, I'm probably a Power Glaive fan, but um, but also just giving your Exarch an extra shirt and catapult, given the the new stats for that, I, I think that's probably the most solid move. Although, I will say, one of the things that the Codex invites us to do is really rethink the way we think about units. And I will say, with the extra attack and with some pretty good melee options, I think there is an opportunity to use Dire Avengers as a uh, almost like a light cavalry unit where you shoot something and then you charge it. And even an MSU unit will have 
uh, 11 attacks, and then three of those are going to be coming in with a, with a pretty good weapon if you also cast some sort of enhancement on them, right? Um, so plus one to wound, for example, if you empowered them. Uh, there are a couple ways to give minus one AP, and I poo-pooed them a little bit in, in a previous video, but this would be a moment, right, if you wanted your Dire Avengers unit to be able to multitask in a really cool way because their, their shuriken fire hits really hard. And then if you needed to just finish off a unit, I think they really have an opportunity to do it in melee, which feels very appropriate to them in some way to me, which I think is is super cool. The shimmer shield is still there as an option. It gives the bear a four plus invulnerable save, which solid for keeping your Exarch on the field. Uh, defensive tactics is, I think it's a little bit different from what it was before. While you have an Exarch model, it can perform an action and still make a ranged attack. That's so good. If you have any secondary that requires you to perform actions like retrieve Nachman data, your Avengers can do it while still participating in the battle. And frankly, there are a bunch of missions that have a primary objective that require you to perform actions. And Dire Avengers are prime candidates for that. At only 60 points, I think it's really, it really makes sense to have a unit of these things in, in just about every list. Uh, because they're efficiently pointed and they just have so much flexibility. There's so many things that your Avengers can do well. Every All the Aspect Warriors have a 5-up invuln save now, so they can fall back on that too. And keep in mind, with Strands of Fate, you can always, anything with any kind of invuln save, you can always make sure it survives. Now, the Exarch powers. All of the uh, Aspect Warriors have an opportunity, or offer the opportunity now, to upgrade the Exarch with one of three Exarch powers. We used to get some kind of Exarch power for free. That's that's gone. Uh, and upgrading them not only gives you the Exarch power, but it also gives the Exarch plus one to wound, and then usually another bonus, but not if you're a Dire Avenger. Or, I'm sorry, plus yes, plus one, not two wound, but wound. I think I said wound. So the Dire Avenger Exarch would go to three wounds. There are three different Exarch powers. Uh, defensive stance, shredding fire, stand firm. They're all cool, but a couple of them are one of them is just insanely pointed. I think the third one is the best. So defensive stance, the first one for 20 points. So that would take a 60 point squad to 80 points. Uh, if you're in your shooting phase, if the unit contains a Dire Avenger Exarch model, uh, you can make, you can shoot even when you're in melee range. Somebody initially wasn't super impressed with this one because you, I don't know, you're, if something charges your Dire Avengers and melee and it's a dedicated melee unit, it will probably kill them. And if they charge a thing, they want to be finishing it off, not fighting it. But somebody on Discord did point out to me that if you were using the webway gate, you could bring them out of the webway, put them in engagement range of enemy units, shoot them, and then melee them. Uh, but I think that that is too – and that is a – like kudos to that guy. That's a super cool idea. But – I think that given how hard the webway gate is to use and how expensive the power is and how niche that moment is, I don't I don't see doing that. Shredding fire is the second one. Uh, the Dire Avenger Exarch triggers Shuriken, the Shuriken ability, so an additional minus two AP on wound rolls of five for 25 points. Even with two catapults, that's just freaking insane. That's absurd. I have to assume that what happened is Shredding fire used to benefit the whole squad and when they play tested it, they came to the conclusion that that was too strong. And so they nerfed it to just the Exarch, but then they didn't change the point cost. It's too much. It's way too much. Don't do it. The last one's great. Stand firm. It's only 10 points. And it gives your Dire Avengers obsec and adds one to the leadership characteristic. So, and it gives you an additional wound on the Exarch. So your 60 point model, 60 point unit goes to 40 points. Your Exarch is up to three wounds. You can... The, the squad can all be killed except the Exarch. He stands a good chance of staying, and they have OPSEC. That's great. That's uh, If you have a single unit of Dire Avengers, it's usually, usually going to be worth taking that power. It's so good. The last thing to say about Dire Avengers is that there's a stratagem. There's a Dire Avenger-only stratagem that for 2 CP allows the whole unit to shoot twice if it's below its starting strength. If you are taking a large unit of Dire Avengers... Uh, it makes sense to think that you're likely going to use this. It's very powerful. With the you, with the Dire Avenger Shirk and Catapult getting the upgrade it got, the opportunity to shoot twice with this, just doubling the damage output of the squad is insane. But I think for 2 CP, you're probably only going to want to do this on a pretty big unit that still has a reasonable 
number of models left in it, except in niche situations. I think I'd probably want uh, at least at least five models left, uh, at least five or six shuriken catapults left if the if the exarch is carrying two of them. Ideally, more, but that's really good. That's really good. Fire dragons, these magnificent Bernie aspect warriors are back. They have uh, they have some real utility now. Uh, they got some big bumps. They have the same same stat line as the Avengers hitting and hitting on threes, but now their toughness four, which is really cool. Uh, the explanation being they have reinforced plates in their armor. I think that's really neat. I think it would have been neat if warp spiders also went to a four, or maybe even uh, scorpions. But I I should look a gift games workshop in the mouth. It's a, it's a it's a good codex. Uh, their guns got better. So the the dragon fusion gun is still range 12, but now it's strength nine minus four AP D six plus two. Woo. Three to eight damage. Freaking solid. Uh, and then the fire pike is strength nine AP minus four D six plus four. Wow. That thing hits hard. That's crazy pants. And they, they still have the, the assured destruction ability. So it's still, you get to reroll, uh, wound rolls of one against vehicles and monsters because their whole niche is killing vehicles and monsters. They have the same five up in save as all, uh, aspect warriors. You can give the Exarch the Dragon Breath, Breath Flamer instead. Strength six minus one AP. It auto hits one damage. Assault six. I wouldn't. Um, I think it's better to keep a unit specialized. You want it to be really good at killing vehicles and monsters, not a little bit worse against vehicles and monsters. To have an okay profile also against infantry, or a decent profile also against infantry. I think you're like single wound infantry. Just just take the fire pike or just take a Dragon Breath Fusion Gun to save the points. They are expensive. So we're up to 23 points a model. Uh, you know, that's even an MSU squad is going to be a little pricey. And at, with only a 12 inch range, getting them in, into position could be a little tricky. I think there's two obvious moves with fire dragons. One is you bring them in out of the web way and they light something up from nine inches away. Now they, they don't have the opportunity at nine inches away to make use of uh, their most efficiently pointed Exarch power, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But I, I honestly, with these guys, I'm not even sure you really need Exarch powers. I think they, they're they going to get the job done probably just based on the data sheet. If you're not deep striking them, you can put them in a Falcon. So the way Falcons work now is they are drop pods. They're pretty efficiently pointed drop pods. They can come onto the board anywhere that's outside of nine inches of an enemy. And this is really cool. The squad inside can get out the same turn and shoot or charge the same turn or shoot and charge the same turn. And you can do it on first turn. I will repeat that. You can do it on the first turn. It specifically says, even if the rules say otherwise, you can do it on turn one. And that's really powerful. So a, a single unit of fire dragons in a Falcon is just an incredible threat. It's going to change the way your opponent deploys in terms of how close things are to the, the front of the line, the ability to drop it into the backfield at any time. And the Falcon itself is no joke. When, oh, we'll talk about it when we get to it, but the pulse laser hits insanely hard. You give it another heavy weapon. Even the shuriken weapons on it are better than they used to be. And then these dragons pop out and they just wreck something. Uh, the, the rate of fire is still low enough for the squad that targets with good invulnerable saves are, are still, it's still a gamble against something with an invulnerable save. I think you want to be able to hopefully cast guide on them or something, but consider that uh, Bill 10 and Ulthway fire dragons will get a reroll anyway, either a wound reroll or a hit reroll. And, and that counts for something using the Bill 10 stratagem on them that allows sixes to hit to generate additional hits. If you put six fire dragons in the Falcon may be worth it in certain circumstances. Uh, this this is a very useful tool for target elimination and also just for making your opponent worry about a thing. Uh, I have tried playing with two Falcons full of Fire Dragons and one Falcon full of Fire Dragons. I currently think that if you're going to use them, one one Falcon is is the way to go. Two is kind of overkill in points. It does gets considerably more expensive at 23 points per model when you, when you add the transport in, uh, but they hit super hard. So Exarch Powers, they have access to... Blazing Fury, Burning Heat, Dragon's Bite, and uh, if you give them an Exarch power, in addition to getting an extra wound, the Exarch also gets plus one to the Ballistic skill. So if your Exarch has a Fire Pike, it can be hitting on a two up. 
that's really good. And with a reroll, you can pretty much guarantee it. That's the one that does D6 plus four. Nevertheless, I'm not totally sold on the Exarch powers, partially because the squad is already so expensive and, uh, you know, these things are not cheap. So Blazing Fury for 20 points adds four inches to the range of the ranged weapons. If you're bringing them in out of Deep Strike or out of a Falcon, you don't need the extra range. It's definitely not worth the extra points. And I don't, I can't imagine playing them in any other way. Burning Heat, while the unit contains a Fire Dragon Exarch, uh, each time a model makes a ranged attack, if it's within nine inches of the target, the attack automatically wounds. It would be good if it weren't 25 points. These things hit so hard anyway at strength nine that I don't think wounding is really your issue, especially if you're running Ulthway Dragons. Um, 25 points, I just think it's too much. For me, it's too much. Dragon's Bite is only 15 points, so theoretically, if you're going to take one, that one might make some sense also just to get the bonuses on the Exarch. Uh, if you target a vehicle or monster, if the attack is um, within half range, the uh, Exarch model adds two to the damage characteristic of the attack, so it would be D6 plus six. And then it does something for the flamer. We're not even going to talk about that. Don't take the flamer. Maybe, you know, for for 15 points to also hit on twos and just make the Exarch insane. Um, the issue there, of course, is that getting within range, the fire pike has a range of 18 inches, so you'll still be at you'll still be exactly not within half range if it comes in out of deep strike or out of a falcon. And I think that's really ultimately that's the reason that I'm I'm not persuaded by the Exarch powers, but they are something to think about. That's Fire Dragon's really solid target elimination. Banshees. Oh, I love Banshees. As an older Brazil enthusiast, Banshees, Banshees are the best. And now they're good. I, I mean, I say the best aesthetically and figuratively and in terms of my enthusiasm for them. But now they're actually really, really good. They're not, let's be honest, they're not the best, but they're good. And I think they can find a place in a lot of lists. They are really, to some degree, what they've always been. They are fast melee shock troops that are going to do serious damage to just about any enemy unit. Uh, it's a really efficient way to clear enemy units off objectives. It's a really efficient way to take out enemy monsters and characters or just annihilate infantry squads. Um, I think that there is one Exarch power build that is just objectively much better than the others. And so we'll talk about it all briefly, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to strongly recommend a particular way of building the squad. So first let's talk about how they changed. They went to three attacks, and the Exarch went to four attacks. Great. So if you were running them with uh, Hunters of Ancient Relics before, now they, they have that attack characteristic always, not just when they're on objectives. The Banshee, standard Banshee sword, which used to be a power sword, is now a Banshee blade, has gone to minus four AP plus one strength instead of minus three AP. So that's great. So it goes right through power armor. Their shuriken pistols are now at 12 inches and have minus one AP in the shuriken ability instead of six inches with no AP. So that's even something to consider. The extra damage from the shuriken weapon is not nothing. They've lost their plus two to charge. They can still advance and charge, but not having that plus two, that's that's a bit of a bummer. Uh, and then they have the same options for special weapons for the Exarch, but they do different things. The Triscale is an Assault 3, five, uh, Strength 5, minus 3, 1 weapon. I don't I don't think it's worth it compared to the other ones. The Executioner used to be the go-to. Uh, it's not minus 1 to hit anymore. That's great. It's plus 2 Strength. That's cool. Uh, minus 3 AP, flat 2 damage. And it would be a really good pick if the Mirror Swords weren't arguably better if you take the Exarch ability. So Mirror Swords are plus 1 Strength. Thank goodness. That was one of the big issues with them before because it was worse than the regular one. Minus three AP instead of minus four. So you lose an AP off the regular blade, but you double each attack that's made makes two hit rolls. So you're doubling your attack characteristic. And the Exarch has a native attack characteristic of or, and there is a way to get that to a five. And so it's possible to get the mirror swords rolling 10 attacks and doing flat two damage with an Exarch power called Piercing Strike, which I will talk about in just a moment. And it is completely worth taking. It's so good. The Banshee Mask still shuts down Overwatch and Set to Defend, uh, but it now also inflicts the better version of Fight Last, which is 
not eligible to fight until after all other eligible units in your army have done so, which is fantastic. It just guarantees that they're, your opponent is not going to be able to do some tricky trick thing to take down your Banshees. They're all acrobatic, so they're minus one to hit in melee. They had that last time. Uh, it is a little disappointing that at the last moment they lost a thing that's on the Eldritch Omens sheet, and that is inflicting minus one to, hit to, uh, to the opponent's attack characteristic. That would have just made them insanely sticky in melee. Uh, so that's sad. I, incidentally, all of the talk that the Craft Worlds Codex was going to be this game-breaking, incredible codex, the best codex we ever saw, nobody else would be able to play anything except for Craft Worlds in competitive play, and it would be have to be FAQ'd on day one. I think that if that codex existed, it existed like six months ago um, and, and, and got nerfed. There, there are definitely sort of obvious fingerprints, especially when you compare it to Eldritch Omens, of last minute adjustments on the codex and probably most of them are for the best i don't i don't want to be that faction that everybody hates that gets nerfed into oblivion in week two of being in the game and i don't think that's where we are um in addition one last amazing thing about banshees when they charge they get plus one to the wound roll that's so good so they're going to wound on the charge uh they're going to wound toughness three or toughness four stuff even on threes and toughness three stuff on twos that's that's great. They're a really hard-hitting fast melee unit. And with that Exarch power, you really turn the Exarch into a hero. So we'll look at all the Exarch powers, but really we're going to wink at the other ones and talk about why Piercing Strike is awesome. So um, there's Graceful Avoidance, Nerve Shredding Shriek, and Piercing Strike. If you take any of these, your Banshee gets an extra a, a plus one attack in addition to plus one wound, your Banshee Exarch, which is why the Mirror Swords on a Banshee Exarch with Piercing Strike, attack 10 times, not eight. Uh, so Graceful Avoidance for 20 points, you can give the whole unit a four up and vulnerable save only in melee. 20 points, is that's not bad, but they already have a five up and they're minus one to hit and 20 points is a lot. If you really wanted your Banshees to be a tar pit unit, I guess, that's a thing that I would have taken if Protect could still affect invuln saves, but as it can't, I'm just totally not sold on it. Uh, nerve Shredding Shriek. Each time this unit, this is 10 points, so efficiently pointed. Each time you finish a charge move, uh, you roll a d6 on a 2-up, you can do one mortal wound to the unit, and sub it subtracts one from combat attrition tests. 10 points is reasonably cheap. A mortal wound is good. Again, this is that like death by a thousand mortal wound cuts thing. Um, and in a situation in which you wiped out most of the squad and they were would have been failing combat attrition tests on twos and now it's threes, I guess it's good, but that's just so niche. Uh, when for another five points, you could get piercing strike and make the Howling Banshees Exarch model do an additional damage on its attacks that's just obviously it's obviously the one you take so the only question with banshees then becomes about how to deliver them to combat what uh i think that they're you, you want them to transport or you want to bring them out of deep strike if you bring them out of deep strike you cast ghost walk on them and use the strands of fate die to guarantee at least a six for the charge on the strands of fate die and then with the ghost walk even if they roll a one they can't fail the charge that's really good or you stick them in a transport i've been i've been putting mine in uh, a wave serpent, you stick five banshees in there with, you know, maybe five dire avengers and a couple of warlocks or, or whatever, uh, or even two squads of banshees. They can't both have piercing strike though. So that's sad. These exarch powers can only be taken once, but the ability to like move a transport into the midfield, keep it out of line of sight, keep your banshees safe, and then they can jump out and advance and charge pretty much anything that's great. If you keep a Strands of Fate die around for the charge roll, you can guarantee that they get there. Uh, they're just an enormously useful tool. I will say the vast majority of the Aspect Warriors have diminishing returns because of the sort of standout Exarch powers, which I actually... It, it, diminishing returns if you include multiple versions of the squad. And I actually like that because I think what a Craft World's Army wants to be, as much as I like the idea of leaning into having 30 Banshees as an Embersol player, and I'll do it in some narrative games, what a Craft World's Army really wants to be is a toolbox uh, where you've got the right tool for every situation. 
And, and so this sort of incentivizes taking a lot of different aspect orders, which is great. Okay, let's talk about striking scorpions. Striking scorpions are really good, and they definitely give banshees a run for their money as the go-to aspect melee option that's not shining spears. Uh, so scorpions, like banshees, went to three attacks. They have a slightly better native armor save at three plus because they're wearing heavier armor. Um, they've got a very different melee profile, uh, and, and there are sort of different ways to make them good. These are sudden assault, or, um, I'm sorry, advanced positions models, so they can start the game in the midfield. And I've already talked about this a couple of other times, so I'll say it again very quickly. One option with scorpions is to start them nine inches from your opponent's deployment zone, and if you get first turn, you move and charge something and basically auto-succeed. And if you don't, you use Phantasm to pick up the models, put them somewhere else, or put them into reserve for free. So, very solid play. Let's talk about their weapons. They all come default with a Shuriken Pistol and a Scorpion Chainsword. Uh, the Scorpion Chainsword gives plus two AP, so strength five. I'm sorry, plus two strength. Only minus one AP, so that's a big come down from the Banshee Blades. But each time the bearer fights, you make an additional attack. So each Scorpion is rolling for attacks. Now, what it initially looks like is that Banshees are your go-to for eliminating heavy infantry, and, and Scorpions are good at butchering light infantry. And while that's true, the build-out for the Exarch and the way Manda Blasters work actually make it so that the Scorpions also play into other kinds of opponents really well, and I think this is what really gets them there as a competitive option. Um, so... I, let's talk about Manda Blasters first, and then we'll talk uh, Exarch Power. So Manda Blasters no longer do that ir irritating thing that they used to do now. All of your unmodified wound rolls of six inflict a mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. Now, if you consider that each of your scorpions with those scorpion chainswords is rolling four dice and the Exarch is rolling five dice, your opportunity to deal mortal wounds is considerably higher. And if you're an Ulthway player, you get to also reroll a wound die. If you cast Doom on the target, oh my goodness, is it insane because you reroll all your failed wounds and get that many more sixes. It is unmodified sixes, so you can't like can't sneakily get it to a five. Uh, and then they have this ability called Sustained Assault, such that unmodified hit rolls of six score additional hits, although it specifically says that they cannot then benefit the Manda Blasters. Now, I had, I think, wrongly stated in a previous video that there was a way to generate additional hits for Scorpions using the Beltan stratagem that generates additional hits on sixes. And because there's no clause like there is for Sustained Assault saying that those don't benefit the Manda Blasters, they must. But then somebody pointed out that in an FAQ for rail rules at the back of the codex, there is specifically a rule saying that powers that generate extra hits don't trigger stuff like Manda Blasters. So theoretically, the clause on the end of Sustained Assault is completely unnecessary. It's just everybody would have played it wrong if they didn't write that there. So sorry, this is one of those moments where that incredibly rare, rare rule comes up. Uh, nevertheless, the ability to generate a bunch of extra attacks, even attacks that don't trigger the Manda Blaster ability, is significant because you are likely to do several mortal wounds, even with five scorpions with the Manda Blasters, and then just a, a cacophony of additional armor saving throws at minus one for your opponent, and it gets even better because the Exarch power is really freaking good. Oh, but let's just talk loadout first. So um, the, the Exarch can take either the, the Biting Blade or the Scorpion's Claw. You want the, you, you want the Biting Blade, I'm telling you right now. Scorpion's Claw is good, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's strength six minus three AP flat two damage, and then it's got a shooting profile that's an assault two shuriken weapon. But the biting blade creates some amazing opportunities. It's plus two, so it takes you to strength five, not six. It's minus two AP, not three, but it makes two additional attacks. So it takes the attack profile for your Scorpion Exarch to a six, but then if you upgrade it and take an Exarch power that raises the attack profile yet one more to a seven. For 15 points, you can give the Striking Scorpion Exarch crushing blow. Each time the unit's Striking Scorpion Exarch model makes a melee attack against a non-Titanic unit, if a hit is scored, it automatically wounds the target. So those seven attacks coming in uh, 
are auto wounding. And this means that if you're hitting something like a pretty tough vehicle, you're likely to rack up maybe five hits with the, the X arc that are all auto wounding at uh, minus two flat two damage. That's good. That's really good. Uh, they could potentially, before the game even starts, jump some really tough dreadnought or something and just kill it. Especially if you add uh, the Manda Blaster attacks in from the other Scorpions in the unit and just that cacophony of other hits, even if they're only wounding on fives or even sixes. Super good. Really worth it at 15 points. Uh, the other two, uh, Deadly Ambush, while the unit contains a Striking Scorpion Exarch, if it's wholly within a train feature, uh, melee attacks made by a model in this unit and improve their armor pen by one. It's good. I just don't like paying 20 points for something that's that situational. And then Scorpion's Sting, do not take this. It triggers the Exarch's Manda Blaster ability on five up to wound, but it costs 30 points. It costs 30 points for your Exarch to be able to count fives in addition to sixes. No, I think it's completely obvious there that that used to benefit the whole squad. They play tested it. It was too powerful. They nerfed it, but they didn't change the point cost. It should be 15 points. Wraith Blades. Wraith Infantry is so good. Uh, all Wraith Infantry now it, it is minus one to the damage characteristic of uh, incoming attacks to a, a minimum of one. They did get a bit more expensive. It's 200 points now for a five Wraith, Wraith Blade squad, but wow. Wow, they are they are tough. Uh, really hard to shift. So Ghost Axes are no longer minus one to hit. That's great. Now it's just plus two strength, minus three AP, flat two damage. Also, three attacks. So we don't need to worry now about Hunters of Ancient Relics or, or making sure that you charge to get plus one to your attack characteristic. It's just, they're just reliable hard hitters. Uh, the Ghost Swords grant you an extra attack at plus one strength. So uh, the Ghost Axe is coming in at Strength 7. The Swords are coming in at a 6. Minus 3 AP again, and then it's 1 damage instead of 2. Uh, the Force Shield still provides a 4-up inbound save, but it costs 5 points. So, you know, your Ghost Axes and Force Shields, that's 45 points per model. That's a lot. And then your regular Wraith Blades are going to be 40 points per model. Um, I think... These have some of the uses for these things are just really obvious. Uh, the the wraith blades with the shields remain our most durable objective holders. With will of uh, Azurian, you can give them obsec also, which is cool. And if you are planning to use a unit of wraith blades as an objective holder, it, it also makes sense to use lightning fast reactions to make them minus one to hit. That's a that seriously reduces incoming damage in a big way. Uh, and you may even want to do something like cast fortune on them. I especially like, and then they'll just be super hard to shift. I, I do especially like Ulthway uh, Wraith Blades and Eandon Wraith Blades. Ulthway Wraith Blades have the advantage of all having that six up feel no, or invuln, excuse me. And while that might not be a thing that you roll a ton, it does mean that you can guarantee using a Strands of Fate dice to make them shrug off anything, which will significantly increase the durability of the unit. Uh, they're good. It, the, if you get, they're slow, right? So they have the same power, the problem they've always had. I think with Wraith Blades, you are either bringing them in out of Deep Strike, using a uh, Strands of Fate die for a six and then casting Ghost Walk again, so they auto succeed on a charge, or you're sticking them in a transport, like it has to be Wave Serpent because they take up two slots uh, and moving them around that way and jumping them out. But they're just, they're just so solid. Uh, some people are going to want to use big units of these things to get into their opponent's backfield, buff the hell out of them, and play Hammer and Anvil where your opponent has to try to deal with them and they're messing your opponent up and then you're just smashing stuff that's on top of the Wraith Blades. Totally legitimate play style. I think there are going to be ways to kill these things. And if you, if, if you over-invest in a big unit of them, I think that you could suffer from bad matchups because there are opponents who are going to have the opportunity to shut down and vulnerable saves and uh, close and melee and just hit them super hard with... I, I lost a unit of Wraith Guard in my last game to like a, an 80-point unit of orc orcs with like big choppa knives just because orcs. Uh, so you, you do have to be... I wouldn't over. I, I am not in favor of over committing to one huge unit, but that is, but that is certainly a play style, and it does have some some play. 
Race guard, so good now. Before, uh, now, good. Uh, again, they've got the minus one thing. And they also have three attacks, by the way. So your Wraith guard, if somebody charges your Wraith guard, they're strength five with three attacks and they, they can no AP, but that's that's no joke. Uh, the new Wraith cannon is 18 inches assault, one strength 10, minus four AP, D3 plus three, and six is to wound, do mortal wounds. That's really good. Uh, honestly, five Wraith guard might be expensive, or even six, but they're, you know what, they're cheaper than five or six dragons in a, a falcon. And the, the, the dragons can no longer fire and fade back into the falcon, but the Wraith guard can just stand there being tough as nails, and that's cool. Don't get me, I'm not crapping on, fal on uh, dragons, by the way. Dragons are good, but, but that is something to consider. Um, the, so the, again, the Wraith guard are going to be a little bit slow to move around. What I have been enjoying doing with these guys is selecting the cannons using behind enemy lines, dropping them into my opponent's backfield on turn two or three. And not only do they do a crap load of damage, but because they're so resource intensive to eliminate, it forces your opponent to pull something that probably they would like to have threatening the midfield and harassing your tough units in the midfield back to deal with the Wraith Guard. And you score some points for behind enemy lines, the Wraith Guard eventually die, but it gives you uh, a, an advantage in the midfield in terms of the distribution of resources. I think they're really really effective in that role. The other thing that you can do, if you're playing Eandon, you drop them into a ruin, they have a two up save and they ignore minus one AP. They become incredibly durable. I already mentioned the Ulthway play. There's just a lot of ways to use these things well. One of the only questions is whether you're gonna take the Wraith Cannon or the D-Scythe. The D-Scythe only has a 12 inch range. It's Assault D6, Strength 10, minus four AP, only does one damage, Blast. And again, on unmodified wound rolls of six, inflict a mortal wound. Again, death by a thousand cut mortal wounds. That's cool, especially with the volume of fire and blast. Uh, I think it really comes, whether or not you want the, the D Scythe or the Wraith Cannon really comes down to what sort of tools you have in your list, other tools you have in your list to deal with hard targets versus hordes. Uh, the D Scythe is just going to be insanely efficient at eliminating hordes because it's strength 10. It even wins Space Marines on a two up. I mean, that's, that's insane, and it, it's going to ignore any armor uh, of any unit with only one wound. So that's amazing, and it's certainly also going to be effective against hard targets. It's just not going to do as much damage to something like a tank as the Wraith Cannons. So what, which one is best for you is going to come down to what other stuff that you, you have in your list. I also think the fact that the D Scythe is five points more expensive, for me, that's a factor. It, it makes me want to lean a little bit more into the cannon. I already mentioned that if you're running a lot of wraiths, you probably want a spirit seer. There are a lot of opportunities. Oh, they can now shoot in melee. That's the other really cool thing. So that those wraith guard you dropped into your opponent's backfield, if your opponent tries to like tag them, you, they can't rely on the wraith bone fists not having any AP. They're still going to get messed up. And lastly, the Wraith Lord, which is in the elite slot now. Some people are mad about this. I'm not mad about this. Uh, I'm not mad about this for two reasons. One, it's we have in a battalion, there are more elite slots than there are heavy support slots, and there are a lot of good heavy support units. Two, it has the core keyword, which they're not doing for the heavy support stuff, and that means that it benefits from psychic powers and even autark auras, and that's cool. It's, it is a way to get two bright lances onto the field that can benefit from guide and from doom bright lances are really good now uh the ghost glaive got a serious boost before the ghost glaive was only good against really hard targets and now like a, a lot of these big melee weapons it has two profiles it has the crushing strike and the sweeping blow the crushing strike is strength plus two taking you to a nine minus four d3 plus three wow that thing hits hard or sweeping blow where you double your attack characteristic so they have an attack characteristic of four. They don't have a decreasing profile. So that's eight attacks, minus two AP, flat two. That's really good. I will, however, point out that if you don't, in fact, spend 15 points on the Ghost Glaive, you still have Wraith Bone Fists, which are really hacking good at strength seven, minus three AP, flat three damage which makes, I think, the Ghost Glaive a little expensive at 15 points. I hate not taking the Ghost Glaive because it just looks so freaking cool. Uh, Minor magnetized, though, so I, I think I think point-wise, the, the fists are good enough that that's probably usually going to be what you want to take. 
the 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 real advantages I think to the uh, the Wraith Lord are that it's pretty efficiently pointed. Uh, the, just the naked Wraith Lord is one hundred points for a unit with toughness eight, nine wounds, a three up save that can benefit from from casts to make it tougher, and it's minus one to all incoming damage. That's really good as, as a unit that keeps like provides lookout sir to uh, a HQ unit that wants to stand on a on a backfield objective, lay down some long range heavy support fire, but also have the melee chops to be able to to jump in if it needs to. Uh, an Ulfway Wraith Lord is particularly good because it has that six up feel no pain or invuln save excuse me, and so you can use strands of fate to shrug off like a las cannon shot. Uh, and, and for me, at least for Ulthway, that, that kind of gets it there. There's so much good stuff in this codex that it's hard to fit even things that are good into our list. I think the Wraith Lords, once you start giving them things, like the Ghost, that's why the Ghost, you've got to try to keep it cheap. If you want to put a couple Bright Lances on it, now it's at 140 points. That's kind of a lot. Uh, if you want to put, however, a couple of Scatter Lasers on it, now it's only at 110 or a couple of shuriken catapults on it, or cannons on it. Now it's only at 120. Shuriken cannons, that's like for a midfield Wraith Lord that wants to uh, move up and grab a midfield objective. But I really think, you know, if you cast, if, if you're playing Eandon and you cast Protect, which you can do because it is a core unit, uh, you take it to a two up, it shrugs. Uh, Minus one. It's there. There. There are a lot of ways to give this things. Pl this thing play. But I think it's either a backline objective holder that is a melee counter puncher slash melee discourager uh, that also can keep HQs safe, or it moves up into the midfield and operates as a counter puncher and bodyguard for HQs. I. I wouldn't just run at your opponent. I mean, that said, I guess if you had like three of the things. And you were running at your opponent, and they were Eandon or, or Ulthway, um, Potentially, it could provide target saturation and protect other things in your list. I think there are a lot of ways to use Wraith Lords effectively, and in a meta in which the like the cheapest units of Wraith Guard are still two hundred points, the ability to get that minus one uh, to incoming damage on a T eight unit at only a hundred points, there's probably some real play there. So that's what I've got. Uh, Sorry, long video, longer than I initially anticipated, but that's HQ, Troops, and Elites. Next time, I will be back with the rest of the Craft Worlds data sheets and the Codex. Hopefully, that one will be a bit shorter. And I hope that you guys are as excited as I am to get these models on the, on the table and play more with them. I think, as I've said before, I think the Codex is really deep and really exciting. And it's, it's, it's going to be a great, this is going to be a great few months for us, I think. Uh, if you like this video, I hope that you will click like. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I hope that you will consider subscribing. If you have not yet told other Craft Worlds players about this resource, I, I hope you might consider doing so. And if you just want to say hello to help out my algorithm, I always appreciate that too. Thanks, guys. I'll be back next time. Oh, last thing. Uh, I do have a Patreon. If you are interested in earning and obtaining early access to these videos, you could sign up for my Patreon, which I will link in the video description. Uh, I will say that for the, the codex review videos, because it's so time sensitive, this, is, this has been a rare circumstance in which my patrons have been getting them at the same time that you do. But after the, the last of these, we'll go back to patrons getting early access. So if that's something you're interested in, maybe, and maybe you'll consider supporting the channel. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.